Good evening and welcome. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning Board on January 20th, 2022. Pursuant to Section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time and place of this meeting has been given by prominently posting the 2021 resolution of the regularly scheduled meetings of the Planning Board of Princeton for February 2021 through January 2022. Copy was filed with the Clerk of Princeton on January 22nd. 2021. Legal notice on the adoption of said resolution was published in the January 25th, 2021 edition of the Princeton Packet. Notice of this meeting also has been posted to the municipal website, princetonnj.gov calendar. Due to the state of emergency in New Jersey regarding COVID-19, the coronavirus, notice that during the declared state of emergency, all regular and special meetings of the Princeton Planning Board will be held electronically via Zoom, was transmitted to the Princeton Packet, Town Topics, and The Times, and was filed with the Clerk of Princeton on April 8, 2020, and again on January 6, 2021. Please note, members of the public will have an opportunity at a specific point in the proceedings to comment and ask questions. Be aware that this meeting is being recorded. Those wishing to comment should virtually raise your hand using the raise hand button near the center of the bottom of your screen, or if you're participating by phone, by pressing star nine. Oral comments will be taken in the order in which hands were raised. We ask with respect that members of the public, please do your very best to limit your comments to three minutes. Um, inappropriate public comment uh, containing obscenity or hate speech, or that relates to matters not before the board will be muted. Carrie, will you call the roll please? Ms. Capizzoli. I'm here. Mr. Chow. Here. Mr. Cohen? Here. Mr. McGowan? Here. Mr. O'Donnell? Here. Mr. Quinn? Muted. I know you're here. Muted. <laughs> I here. Uh, Mr. Texarney? Here. Mr. Taylor? You're muted, Jack. No, I saw Jack Taylor. There we go. <clears throat> Here. Am I? Thank you. There I am. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Bodekheimer. Here. Can you put your video on, please? Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Okay, we have a quorum. All right. Great. Mary, I just want to let you know that even though you didn't call my name, I am here. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, sorry for that oversight. I know sometimes I run late, so I think you were probably. <laughs> oh my you know. gosh. You were just <laughs> probably expecting me a time. I understand. Miss Sachs. <laughs> Miss Sachs. No worries. Never, never to be forgotten. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, on, we, on we to have announcements. A Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Phillip. Um, I have a, a few announcements uh, of my own, and then I'll turn things over to staff or other board members if they would like to give any. Um, first of all, I, I'm really sorry to have missed the meeting on the 6th of January. I, I think board members know uh, that my dad passed away just very shortly before the meeting, and I could not have paid attention, much less capably <laughs> chaired the meeting. Um, so, and I appreciate all the condolences that I've received and I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, and I wanna thank the board for appointing me chair, even in my absence. <laughs> it is a, a true privilege um, and I will do all I can to sustain your confidence through the year. Um, I'd like to welcome Nat Bodekheimer to the board. Um, he brings great experience and perspective, and I'm sure he'll be a real asset to this board and, and therefore to the community. Um, next, I'd like to just quickly talk about the board retreat. Um, I think everybody got uh, an email and a maybe a poll. poll. Um, I'm not sure whether we've gotten everybody's response to that, but we will nail a date down in the next couple of days after we check to make sure that all the staff that need to be there um, 
are available. So stay tuned for uh, confirming the date um, on that. Um, uh, next, a few comments about board um, subcommittees. I have the task um, with Tim Quinn's advice and counsel to appoint board subcommittees. And so tomorrow you'll receive an email um, asking that you express interest in which subcommittees you'd like to serve on. And that uh, attached to that email will be a list of the committees and a description of what they do, um, as well as a chart showing who was on what committees last year. Um, and as soon as we get your preferences, um, we'll appoint the committees and circulate that list. Um, and just to be clear, um, by way of a reminder to, to most of you, all board members receive notice of all subcommittee meetings and are welcome to attend them. Um, if you're not on the committee, you can't vote if the committee uh, takes a vote, but all are welcome to attend and provide input. Um, uh, and every member of the board, um, including alternates, uh, need to serve on at least one committee. Um, and finally, last announcement, um, there's one committee that will change. Um, effective this year, the board will return to its tradition of monthly officers meetings and discontinue what was called the executive committee, which was the officers plus the two council members who serve on our board. Um, the executive committee was in place for a few years and was especially helpful as we were navigating the early implementation of the affordable housing plan. Um, but going back to monthly officers meetings, they of course include Tim and me <clears throat> meeting with uh, planning office staff and with Jerry. Um, and we're going to include two additional board members on a rotating basis in the officers meeting. So we'll probably start, you know, based on um, length of service on the board. Uh, and so each, um, each officers meeting will include two additional members of the board to just engage board members in a more active way and, and give everybody a chance over the course of the year, maybe more than once to um, have that sort of less formal interaction in Q&A with staff and, and, um, and Jerry. And I hope that um, that works out well. I think it will. And, um, and thanks really, uh, kudos and uh, recognition to Tim for suggesting that, um, that you know, new, new tradition of, uh, of including other board members on a rotating basis. I think it'll be, I, I hope it'll be a good thing uh, for everybody. So that's all the announcements I have. Does anybody else, any staff or other board members have any announcements? Uh, Louise, Mr. I do Rana? have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I'd like to suggest that possibly uh, you consider uh, for the non uh, officer members of the board, when you bring them in, instead of it being strictly by seniority, you do one senior member and one junior member. Um, That's a good to, idea. And, you know, to, to kind of balance out the, the range of experience. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, so we'll come up, I'll work with staff uh, on, a, on a schedule with that in mind, Owen. Um, and then we'll, we'll let people know to make sure folks are available. Uh, the, the committee meets um, every, um, it meets once a month on a Thursday at 2 p.m. And it's the Thursday of the week between the two board meetings. <laughs> um, so it'll so be the second Thursday of each month. Second Thursday, right. The second Thursday of the month, right, 2 p.m. Okay, um, any other questions or Suggestions or announcements? I'll, I'll, I'll throw in one more if uh, sure. anybody else is there. Is there <laughs> any update? <laughs> yeah, really. Is there any update on the uh, master plan? Oh, thank you. Um, you know, let me turn to um, 
well, uh, I'll tee it up a little bit and then I'll invite um, uh, Michael Laplace to add comments. Um, the, the consultant that was chosen came back with the budget that was a good bit higher than was expected, which led to a series of meetings and um, uh, or series of conversations and at least one face-to-face sit-down meeting to pour over um, the scope of work and what was expected and really talk about that um, specific topic. And, um, and so uh, the ne next step, I think, well, I'll leave it to Michael to <laughs> describe the next step, but I will just add that it is really important that this work get underway and nobody has lost sight of that. Um, I think given Omicron, you know, it's not the worst thing that we weren't trying to forge ahead over the past couple of months, but it, it has been quite some time since we thought we were moving ahead. And um, I appreciate everybody's patience uh, with that very, very much. So Michael, uh, what's the next step from your perspective? Well, um, first, I wanted to just flesh out a little bit what we were talking about. Um, staff has met with the um, consultant group that was chosen to work on the master plan to go over their cost estimate report. And we went line by line to really try to understand, you know, are these costs realistic or appropriate? And we, we had a really good dialogue with them. Basically, what we were told is that um, they had an idea in mind of the time that it would take and the cost to do the kind of master plan Princeton was expecting based on our request for proposals. After they were interviewed and heard the selection committee's many questions and concerns, and particularly the priority that Princeton is placing on engagement, community engagement and involvement with the community. Um, it really, they went back and, and huddled on this and, and talked about it amongst their own group, project group, and realize that what Princeton's asking for is really exceeding what a lot of communities have asked for in their master plan process. So they came back to us with, with what they feel is a more realistic budget. They also extended the time. We thought we'd be able to maybe do this in one year in, in 2022. They have said that it will probably take realistically about 14 months, which will take us obviously into 2023. Um, so what I'm going to do is put a report together to send to the administration and to council to explain um, what now the, the cost will be and how it impacts what we've budgeted for the master plan this fiscal year and perhaps how the remainder or the, the, the amount of money that was um, the portion that sort of was above what we originally expected that could maybe be carried through to the 2023 fiscal year when we're finishing up the project. So that was the discussion that took place. Uh, we really wanted to make sure we were gonna be getting value for this higher budget figure that we were, that we were getting reported back to us. Um, and then we, th we think we are. Um, so that's basically what's gonna happen. I need to report back to administration and to the council. Michael, when do you expect the process to be agreed and work to begin? I would hope for us to be getting, getting underway in February. So I'm an optimist, but that's my hope at this point. But I, oh, and I really appreciate your bringing it up. And I want to apologize um, to the master plan committee for sort of leaving things hanging at the end of last year, because uh, I intended to um, send around some kind of an update and just at least let you know where things stood other than sorry for the delay. Um, and, um, and I did not. And um, for that, I, I apologize. Chair, I, I have to jump in too and defend my chair because um, you have been completely focused on us moving forward with this. And to be quite honest, the consultant lost some time in getting back to us and reporting. So I wanted the rest of the board to know how diligently you've been trying to move this ahead. And it really was a little bit, we were surprised that the initial response from the consulting team was, was not as soon as we thought it would be with the cost estimate report that we asked for. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, anything else? Madam Chair, I just wanted to point out there is a hand up in the attendees. I don't know if you want to accept a question at this time, but. Um, Josh Sinder. Josh, 
Zinder, um, did he's supposed uh, to be? I guess, Jim, did, were you saying something? Is he supposed to be a panelist? Is Josh here for a? I don't believe. So. I do not no. know. <laughs> no. That's sort of that. Um, I Josh, assume he has a question about the master plan, but uh, probably. Uh huh. Okay, why don't we bring him over quickly and, and just uh, see what his question is. I uh, thank you. Yes, my question was about the master plan and I was just curious um, there were a few items I know that were in discussion towards the end of the year that were pushed off for the master plan discussion, like the with a spoon affordable overlay. And I'm just curious from a process point of view, will those be done sort of during the process and individual ordinances to move items that were move, you know, to move them forward, or will they wait for the completion of the master plan? I do not know I, how to answer that question because I think it's more I think of a question, a question for question council. For council. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'll just say it's I I don't I'm not sure who gave you the answer that the Witherspoon overlay was being pushed off until part of the master plan. Um, I'm not sure if that's ac entirely accurate, but um, I think you're right. There are so many things that have been pushed over to the master plan and in, including most recently suggestions that both permit parking and cannabis be included in the master plan. So um, I couldn't understand why there might be some concern that the master plan would be uh, done even in, in the upcoming decade at this rate. But um, I think um, for th that's a, the, the question is a good one and one that the master plan subcommittee will need to, uh, I think, interface with council on that and and prioritize um, some things and leave other things that are not as time sensitive towards the back end. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So is it. Um, okay, then any any other questions, comments, announcements? All right, let's look at the um, minutes from February 6, 2020. It's my understanding this is the last set of minutes from 2020. <laughs> Yay. Uh, and uh, it really has taken a long time to catch up on them, but it is good news that we are getting a lot closer to catching up. Um, any any uh, suggestions or edits for this set of minutes? And if not, would someone like to move them? I'll move them. Moved by Mr. Cohen, seconded by? Second. Mr. Quinn, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, abstaining? Um, I'm gonna abstain on the grounds that I wasn't at that meeting. Understood, thank you, yes. Okay. Um, Yes. The next we have, next up, we have findings of fact, um, trustees of Princeton University, minor site plan with variance, 91 and 110 to 116 Prospect Avenue, file number P2121-012PM. Um, Jerry or Michael, do you have any well, comments I, on I this? I just want to say this is a very significant resolution, so I'm very excited. <laughs> Yes, it is. Uh, it really is good to see. Barry, thank you for all your hard work on it. Jerry, you're on mute. I could go over the resolution if you'd like. Hopefully it's pretty self-explanatory. Maybe the best bet would just be if any board members have any questions. We'll entertain questions. And if there are none, I'd appreciate a motion and a second. Uh, Julie Capazzoli, I'll move to approve. Thank Sorry. you. Moved by Ms. Capazzoli, seconded by Mr. McGowan. Um, we have a roll call vote, please, Carrie. Thank you. Ms. Capazzoli? Yes. Mr. Chow? Yes. 
Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. McGowan? Yes. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. All in favor, motion carried. And I vote yes also. <laughs> I think I, I think I'm. Um, yes, you were there. I got Miss Wilson. I'm pretty sure I was there for all of that. <laughs> okay, next up we have a hearing. Again, trustees of Princeton University. This is preliminary and final major site plan for Dillon Gymnasium expansion at Elm Drive, block 45.01, lot 101. File number P2121-090. P. Madam Chair, um, the notice is adequate and uh, Kerry, I take it proof of publication and service are in order. That's correct. The, the board thus has jurisdiction. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. LaPlace, do you want to tee this up or do we go straight to Mr. DeGrazia? I'll give a brief introduction because as you okay. know, the university is always giving a very extensive one. So I don't want to- If you could raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony about the gift will be the truth? I do. So I swear or affirm. Thank you. Um, Princeton uh, University this evening is seeking major site plan approval for the renovation and expansion of Dillon Gymnasium. It's an existing collegiate Gothic style recreation facility on the university's central campus. It was constructed in 1947. Um, the project site is located along Elm Drive um, and it's roughly, the area is roughly east of the Arts and Transit District. And where the gym is located, immediately to the southwest and east of the building are residential colleges. To the north are various academic buildings. Um, and the site is well served by the campus network of pathways and service drives. Um, the zoning for the site is E2, the educational zone of the former borough. It's a permitted <coughs> use, the gymnasium. And you'll hear tonight about some requests for variances for signage for the for the for the new you know for the expanded and renovated facility. So I think that's that's an adequate overview. Let, let me just ask Nat a question this time. I just got a, a some information just a few minutes ago, literally, that your your spouse works for the university. Uh, the, that question was addressed to me. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I think given that probably the best bet would be to recuse yourself. You wouldn't be eligible to vote anyway because we have nine regular members present um, and therefore the two alternates cannot vote. But I, um, is that, you amenable to that? Uh, that? That is fine. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so Mr. DeGrazia, I think you were chomping at the bit earlier to say something even before Mr. LaPlace. No, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, right ahead. I, I, yeah, so uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, as uh, Michael indicated, this application involves a well known building, Dylan Gym, and essentially we're here to upgrade and modernize the facilities there. Um, we're improving energy efficiency, um, increasing accessibility through a new lobby, a new elevator. There's a lot of really great elements to this project, the introduction of green roofs, decreasing impervious coverage in the project site, uh, removal of module structures, landscaping improvements, and the list goes on and on. Um, to get us started, I'd like to introduce um, university architect, uh, Ronald McCoy. Unless, Jerry, would you like us to have all of our witnesses sworn in? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Let's okay. do that. So, and, I, and I should make sure they're all in as panelists as well. Uh, I see Ron McCoy is here. Let me see who's else on the list. There's just so many <laughs> in the, Brian, okay. Um, do we have uh, Chris, Christian Roach or Chris yes, Roach? Yes, he's here. Uh, is he, okay, he's in the panelist list? Yes, okay. yes. All right, I think, I think that's everybody then. Okay, so it's uh, Kristen Roach, um, Ron McCoy, and then who else? Um, oh, we, have, we have Jeff Graydon, Jarrett Messina. Hold on one second. 
Jared, J-A-R-E-T, J-A-R-R-E-T-T? J-A-R-E-T-T. J-R, okay. Mark okay. Sanderson. M-A-R-K? Uh, yep. yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Nicole Holmes. Okay, thank you. Brian Stankis. Yep. Uh, who am I missing? Um, Tatiana. Oh, Tatiana. And Stomo. Yes. Thank you. Who's the last? Oh, yeah. Okay. If, if you could all raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. I do. So, so this morning, from, if each of you could um, just state your name and spell your last name. We'll start with Ron. Ron McCoy, uh, M-C-C-O-Y, University Architect. Christian, why you Mr. McCoy, next? could you, uh, yeah, just call on your professionals, will, one will, or yeah, the other. Yeah, I, will, yeah. I will do that. Christian, why don't you go next? Sure. Christian Roach, R-O-C-A-G, a professional engineer of Langen. Brian, next. Good evening, I'm Brian Stankus, S-T-A-N-K-U-S of WSP, professional traffic engineer. Jarrett. Jarrett Messina, M-E-S-S-I-N-A. I'm an architect, I'm the project manager for Princeton University. Tatiana. Uh, Tatiana Shulika, C-H-O-U-L-I-K-A, landscape architect. Jeff Graydon. And Jeff Graydon, G-R-A-Y-D-O-N, Princeton Athletics. Storm. Uh, it's Tom Bishop, B E S S H O, uh, registered, registered landscape architect. Mark. Mark Sanderson, S A N D E R S O N. I'm with Digsaw, I'm a professional architect. Okay, I think that's who we have, right? Did I leave anybody out? Nic okay. Nicole Holmes, was she? Oh, oh uh, I was wrong. She's not here this evening. Oh, okay. Okay, whenever you're ready. You, Chris. Okay, great. Um, so I, as I was saying, I'd like to introduce University Architect Ronald McCoy um, to present, uh, to go through our presentation and we'll mark this um, slide presentation as exhibit A1. Okay. Okay, good evening. We're back. We love to be here uh, and we're happy to share with you the uh, project that uh, Mr. Place and Christopher have both uh, started to talk about. I'm going to share my screen. I will walk through the slides. And Jerry, I will let you know what slide we're on as we, as, as we go. You. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, one second. All right. This is the cover page, slide one. So uh, as has been said, um, we're here to talk about the renovation and addition to the existing Dillon Gym building. This project is related to, closely related to some of our strategic uh, priorities as part of the current uh, generation of campus projects, in particular, the increase of undergraduate uh, student body population. It's also particularly tied to the University Health Services building, which uh, uh, you have seen prior. Uh, because these two projects uh, support the health and wellness of the undergraduate student body population, which is always important, uh, becoming more and more important uh, uh, in the current climate. Um, so Dylan Jim, just a little bit of history. The original building was uh, built in 1903, demolished or destroyed by a fire in 1944, and rebuilt in 1947. At the time it was rebuilt, the undergraduate student body population was about 3,000 students. With the current uh, enrollment growth of, of the undergraduate population will be at 5,700 students. And so we need to right size this facility to catch up with um, student growth over time and even to give us some comfort uh, for the current population growth and even in, into the future a little bit. Uh, the overall site plan does leave room for future additions because this is a central campus site and we wanna, we wanna maintain that uh, optionality. For, for future additions. I would say that um, the 
project, the, all the users of the project, as we'll talk about when we talk about staff reports, uh, are staff, faculty, staff, and students uh, who already commute to campus. Uh, undergraduates do not have cars on campus. So there's really no parking surcharge related uh, to parking growth related to this project. In terms of the uh, employee population of the building, there are currently about 12 FTE working in Dillon Gym. And this would have a modest increase, maybe up to two additional FTE. So that's also a very modest uh, increase to the employee base of the, of the Dillon Gym operation. Ron, what, are, Ron, what does FTE stand for? Full-time equivalent. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a robust group of student workers who serve the who serve Dillon Gym, uh, about 75 currently, and uh, that will grow. But again, that's a there's no impact because those students are are living uh, on campus. So that's that's a, a, a bit of an overview of the project, just generally. I'm on slide two, and um, this is sort of jumping right into the essence of the project. Uh, you'll see on the left um, an addition. Uh, of a fitness center on the southeast corner of uh, the Dillon Gym complex. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see the existing squash courts, which are being renovated uh, to serve as a more fitness space for the project. And as I go through this, we'll explain all of that. Now I'm on slide three and I'm going, this is a transition slide. We're gonna talk about the context and planning principles for the project. Here on slide four, you can see the location which is, uh, uh, as has been said, at the crossroads of a lot of important campus pathways. In particular, you'll see going east to west across this slide is what we call the east-west connector. That's a project that will um, uh, impact the Dillon Gym project. It will go through the future um, site of Hobson College, which we will bring some in, in 2022. Uh, it goes past uh, the north side of the University Health Services facility and past the new uh, Geo Hall, Schmidt Hall project, and then out Ivy Lane and Western Way. Elm Drive, the north-south uh, road through the campus, um, is, a, is a, on the east side of Dillon Gym and the east side of the, of the complex. I will say right now, since we'll, talk, we'll be talking a little bit about Elm Drive, that um, Elm Drive, as you know, is a controlled access at the north and south end, so only vehicles that are admitted to campus can travel on Elm Drive. We have in the last year through our through the initiative of our transportation and parking services group, severely limited the amount of vehicular traffic on Elm Drive. We're in the process also of a, of a planning study for Elm Drive to enhance its um, pedestrian and cycling and, and sort of multimodal um, uh, transit or multimodal movement up, up and down the street with ex and, and, ex and excluding cars and buses. Um, uh, buses are now uh, not driving on Elm Drive and we're severely limiting the cars. We will not exclude the cars completely. We do have service vehicles, but all that is to say that uh, Elm Drive as it's going in the future is more and more a pedestrian street. We're already, if you're on campus, you see um, bikers, pedestrians, cyclists, uh, scooters, skateboards, all going up and down Elm Drive and, and very, very little vehicular traffic. So I know that's gonna be a concern in some of the traffic comments, but we want, I wanted to highlight it here while we're on this slide. Now I'm on slide five. This is a diagram from our 2026 campus plan. And it just illustrates what I talked about in the site plan, which is this swath of projects from east to west across the campus. Everything here in the salmon color is a new project that's part of, the, part of our current campus plan and capital plan. And you see Dillon Gym, which is the first building on the western end of that, that new east-west uh, connector. We're very fortunate to have an extremely central site to expand uh, the uh, 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 campus rec facilities. Uh, it's a great asset to have Dylan Jim on the, in the center of the site and to have the capacity for the kind of expansion that we're imagining in this project. Okay, now I'm on slide six. This is a uh, uh, photograph of the 1903 version of uh, Dillon Gymnasium from uh, designed by Cope and Stewartson. We're looking at the east side of the building. You'll see in the original building, the tower was on the northern end. And when it was, when it was rebuilt and reopened in 1947, the tower was moved to the uh, eastern side of the building. But it's always been a campus landmark and the tower has been part of that, that landmark uh, nature of the building. I'm on slide seven now. 
And again, just to give you some contextual history of the of the project, um, and I will I'll refer back to some of these slides in the new design because the, the new design tries to um, uh, I'd say reconnect to some of the really strong campus planning principles that were part of the original uh, design for Dylan Jim. In particular, on the left here, you'll see the Brokaw Memorial Arch, which was part of a complex that provided um, a gymnasium and shower facilities for undergraduate students who are not part of varsity athletics. And just south of the, of the arch, we're looking to the north, basically, uh, were, the, were the Brokaw Fields. Where, which were the recreation fields on campus. On the right is uh, a view through Brokaw Arch looking to the north up Elm Drive. So Elm Drive was a really majestic alley uh, that was an axial street. Uh, in 1947, when the squash courts were added, this very strong campus vista was lost and the Elm Drive sort of um, did a little S curve around this. And what we're doing in the new project is we're recreating this moment as the entrance for, for, student, for students into the campus rec facility. So currently, students enter into the north end of Dillon Gym. Uh, with this design, uh, all, all users of Dillon Gym will enter into a new entrance, which sort of is, on, is more, more or less roughly aligned with this historic entrance uh, that was created by the Brokaw Arch. Now I'm on slide eight. Uh, this is just a, a bird's eye view looking down on the facility, a little bit of reminder of context. You'll see the uh, uh, orange boxes, which are dotted in to the area that we call Dillon Court, uh, which are really temporary trailers uh, that will be removed as part of this project. Uh, Stevens Fitness, you'll see on the, on the left, and the squash court ring, you'll see uh, right in, in the middle of the diagram. Those are facilities that are gonna be renovated and repurposed as, as part of this project. Now I'm on slide nine. Uh, this is a view of uh, Dillon Court looking to the north, not what we consider a Princeton University Instagram moment, but um, this is gonna be transformed by, by the new design in some really exciting and uh, significant ways. So we're looking at the south wall of the uh, squash courts and those little, those little windows are really ventilation for the, for the squash courts. Now I'm on slide 10, and this is really just to illustrate um, some of the beautiful detailing, materiality, um, characteristics of the existing building. You can see from that slide that I showed at the beginning of the presentation that we are adding a contemporary building uh, uh, that contrasts with this, but is also a building that's designed to be very respectful and learn a lot in terms of materiality, the details, the proportions, and serve as a very good partner to the historic building. At the same time, we are, I'd say, thoughtfully repurposing that existing building, bringing new life to it, making some modifications to the outside to bring natural light into it, but also restoring the historic facade of the building as part of our major maintenance efforts on, on campus. And also updating the building's energy and making a more uh, efficient building and also accessibility. I'll get to that in a bit. Now I'm on slide 11. I'm gonna show, uh, this is a transition slide to slide 12. And these next three slides are gonna talk about some of the uh, big picture sustainability initiatives. There's a lot going on in this building that we're, that we're very happy to be able to develop. Uh, this one talks about the resource conservation, which is uh, obviously related to the adaptive reuse of the existing facility, which minimizes uh, energy of new construction. We will have a selective reuse of salvaged stone <clears throat> for the exterior walls and the wood from the existing squash courts, which will be selectively reused, which will add some character to the, to the design. And as I just mentioned, we are restoring the existing Dillon facades. The next slide in this sequence uh, talks about uh, the principles of biophilic design, enhancing wellness. As I mentioned, this is part of the health and wellness um, um, facilities that are serving the student body population and carbon mitigation. So these are um, uh, incorporated in the design through natural ventilation, relaxed temperature and humidity set points. As an, as an athletic facility, uh, we can relax those set points because people are active and energetic. We provide fans, we move air through the facility, we have the ventilation through the roof that draws air through it. And that then you know, puts less demand on the heating and cooling system of the building. We have mass timber construction 
uh, for the for the roof of the addition, and I'll show that in the renderings. We have fantastic views and vistas out uh, to the landscape, and those views and vistas are are managed through uh, uh, overhangs and a kind of uh, perforated scrim wall that sits outside the perimeter of the building to pr provide passive solar control for the facility. I'll mention here uh, before before I forget that when we get to the renderings, you will see a lot of glass in this pavilion. One of the staff comments was encouraging us, uh, one of the PEC comments was encouraging us to use bird safe glass. And I will I'll say right now that the design does have bird safe glass in this, in this pavilion edition. The last of these slides is just an overview of uh, stormwater management strategies. And Christian will talk in more detail about this in, in a few minutes. But we have a green roof on this new addition. We're also putting a green roof on the existing Stevens building, which is, is really not, is just a minor renovation otherwise, but the green roof is an important part of our stormwater management. We're uh, incorporating uh, pervious paving with underground storage on the north side of the, pl of, the, of the Dillon Gym, the north side of the squash court wing. And we have uh, landscape swales that you'll see in the landscape design presentation. All right, now I'm on slide 15, and I'm gonna talk about the building program. So this is just a, on slide 16, a block diagram of the building program. You'll see that on the left, 24,000 plus square feet of uh, strength and conditioning equipment, and then in that sort of purplish color, group fitness. So those are the two largest demands from students in terms of their health and wellness needs. Uh, strength and conditioning, which includes general fitness and cardio, circuit training, fitness functions, and uh, also the, the group fitness classes, such as yoga, spin classes, and things like that. Those are what the students are demanding, and that's what we're really, really short on. So this is not adding things like basketball courts or the, or the swimming pool. It's really focusing strength on strength and conditioning and group fitness. And in the, in the green uh, box, you'll see a lobby and a social space so that the building is a welcoming space, encourages people to linger, students to linger. They could even have uh, meet with uh, study groups and provide a, the Dillon Gym becomes part of the social life of the students before and after their exercise work. Now I'm on slide 17 and this illustrates how those blocks of program are distributed through the existing building and the, and the new building. So I'll start in the lower right at the fitness uh, edition. That blue rectangle, that blue square is the, uh, um, the new addition at the Southeast corner of the facility. It's separated from the existing uh, squash wing by a, a small connector and a green roof over that connector. Then you'll see this new entrance that I mentioned. This is now the primary entrance for, um, for all the users of Dillon Gym that comes into a, a generous size lobby that has a new window that looks like to the back to the east onto Elm Drive. And also, Mr. McCoy, yes, uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, one of our members, Mr. O'Donnell, has um, gotten disconnected from the meeting and needs to be uh, brought back in. So, um, Carrie, could you make that happen, please? I think he's in the waiting room. Okay. I, I apologize for interrupting your flow. <laughs> That's okay. I can I can find my flow again. <laughs> Owen, are uh, you with us? Yeah, I just want to make sure. There he is. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Okay. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. No, no where did we where, where did where did we lose you, Owen? Any... Uh, we were on slide twelve, I believe, uh, nice. talking about resource con conservation. Okay. Uh, let me just quickly bring you up to speed here. So this is where we were. I was also talking about the biophilic. Uh, design principles, natural ventilation, mass timber, views of the landscape. I mentioned that the building has bird, birds safe glass. Stormwater management, this is just an overview. We're having a green roof on the Stevens Fitness and a green roof on the addition. Christian will talk more about this in detail. Building program, this is 15, transition to 16. I was mentioning that the, the main overwhelming purpose of this building is to increase the space dedicated to general fitness and cardio for the students, both, both strength and conditioning, group fitness, and also this green box represents the, uh, a kind of social space so the students can feel welcome and can hang out and even do group work in the lobby. All right, now back on 17. This is where we, we lost you or we, we, realize, we realize you left us. And so 
uh, this is talking about uh, how that those blocks of program are distributed through the building. At the southeast bit, bit, uh, part of the diagram, you'll see the fitness wing. This is a new addition connecting back to the lobby and the new entrance that picks up the historical entrance to the north up Elm, Elm Drive. This plaza, which is on the north side of the lobby, is currently just a big asphalt parking lot. So part of our reduction of impervious surface is the transformation of this into a pedestrian plaza with seating, landscape, and one ADA parking space. So this is a big enhancement in terms of the campus character uh, as an arrival place. We're also taking advantage of the tower as I'd say a landmark, but not necessarily functionally. We're not using the tower as part of this project because it's, it's a very congested tower. It's not ADA accessible, but being able to have the entrance to the gym off of the plaza, which is anchored by the tower, gives a sense of identity that um, is very, very important to the project. As we move to the west through along the squash courts, you'll see this rhythm of vertical lines through this space. Those are the trusses that would that used to define the boundaries of the squash courts. So the squash courts are the space between those trusses. And those trusses exist because this whole blue rectangle is a, is a box of space that spans over the swimming pool, which is below. So uh, that, that system of trusses uh, provide a great uh, open structure for an additional fit transformation from squash into fitness. There are some offices that are tucked in here uh, at the corner as well. And then Stephen Fitness is, is a, as, as I said, a, a relatively light touch renovation of an existing fitness space, as is this uh, light touch renovation of a studio space uh, up in the north uh, west corner of the, of the site. I'm gonna point out this elevator here. Uh, this is an important addition because that allows us to enhance the accessibility of the building, which right now you'll see in a minute is not, uh, does not have a lot of accessibility service. And then also I'll point out this pathway that comes to the west and then to the north. As it goes to the north, it's on A level of the Dillon Gym, which is a level where we just renovated, well, a few years ago we renovated all of the uh, locker rooms. So now we're able to sort of complete um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the new addition connects to re recently renovated locker rooms for the users of Dillon Gym. Um, all right, now I'm moving to slide 18, which is one level down. This shows that swimming pool, uh, which is spanned by those large trusses that I talked about. And underneath the new addition are uh, mechanical space, but also most importantly, are two studio spaces for, mul for multi-purpose group rooms. And those could also open out onto a social space and that social space opens out again onto a nice landscape space. And then there's a sort of uh, general purpose um, rec outdoor recreation facility that is, is uh, uh, primarily given over to uh, outdoor basketball court for, for, uh, for use outdoors. So we're, that's the use of the, of the site, which is gonna be a great improvement. Now I'm on slide 19 and I'm going up one level. So now we're at the rooftop level of the addition and you'll see the green roof here. You'll see the green roof at the Stevens Fitness. And now we're at the level of the existing gymnasium and the basketball courts. And um, I'm gonna show you later some addition, some work we're doing at the southern corner of Stevens Fitness. And that's because Steven, the roof of Stevens Fitness serves as an emergency egress from the Dillon Gym. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an exit from, from Dillon Gym uh, in the corner of the building here that comes out onto this uh, uh, walk that goes over the roof and exits down a fire stair. That fire stair um, is um, you know, nearing the end of its useful life. And so we thought we'd take advantage since we're doing all this work on Dillon Gym to um, rebuild that fire stair to make sure that it uh, maintains its, uh, its function as a, as a means of egress. Now we're on slide 20. This is a section through the building. We're looking to the west. And this is primarily to um, uh, talk about how we're able to dramatically increase the accessibility conditions of the building. So I mentioned the pool at, at the lower level um, and the locker room and the, the, uh, the new Stevens Fitness space that's part of the squash courts, which is at the A level and the gymnasium up above. So right now the entire Dillon gym only has 20% of the spaces in Dillon Gym are accessible. 
uh, on slide 21 by adding that elevator that I pointed to on the plan and making it a multi-stop elevator that connects all these different levels, we can make the building 80% accessible. The only portion of the building that's yet to be made accessible are some portions of the building at the far northern end of the building that are not part of this project, but this project does not preclude the ability to make those northern portions of the building ADA compliant in the future. And that would be our goal to make this building 100% ADA compliant. So it's a significant improvement and we have a little bit more work to do in a future addition, a future renovation. On slide 22, and uh, this is gonna be, I'm gonna hand this off to our landscape consultants, James Corner Field Operations. Uh, Chris, Christopher, do you wanna um, yep. handle yeah. the... Yeah. Yeah, we have two consultants here, and let's have them both sworn in because they, they were can... both sworn in already. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's uh, go through their their qualifications. So, Tatiana, you want to go first? Yeah, uh, my name is Tatiana Shulika. I've been practicing landscape architecture for 33 years. I have a, a bachelor's in landscape architecture from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. I have a master in sciences. Uh, in the management of natural resources from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And I have a master in landscape architecture from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Um, that's it. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah. And, I... and, and Stone, can you give your credentials? Sure. My name is Stone Bishop. I'm a senior associate at James Bond Field Operations. And I have a Bachelor of Agriculture from University of Tokyo and Master of Landscape Architecture from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I've been practicing landscape architecture uh, for over 15 years, and I'm currently registered in the state of New Jersey and state of Pennsylvania. Okay, so we wanted to introduce and present them as, a, as witnesses. Um, uh, Tatiana will do the presentation, but she and Stom are a team in developing all the landscape strategies for the project. Okay, thank you. We, we accept your qualifications. Both of you. Okay, Go ahead. I'll move uh, the slides. Okay, so uh, this is slide 23, and uh, you can see an illustrative site plan of um, the project, and it's very clear how it's nestled uh, between these colleges that are all around, and it's how it's the heart of this community. Uh, you can also see on the north side an east and north facing plaza that uh, is just uh, used to be a parking lot and today is planted and uh, the front of the building and the lobby. And on the south side is the addition with a green roof on it, as well as an open space uh, for um, outdoor activities um, and athletic activities. And also a green roof on top of the Stevens wing on the left side on the east side. And the next slide shows um, basically 24 the now. Oh, slide 24 shows the um, pedestrian connections to these two areas, the north side uh, going up Elm Drive and then into the lobby. Um, it's all pedestrian now. And then on the south side, the connections to the east west connector uh, with um, all the walkways that take you down to the addition as well as the uh, open play space. The next slide it is slide 25 and shows the portions of these pedestrian uh, walkways that are fully accessible. So on the north side, the um, lobby is accessible uh, and also uh, links directly to a parking spot uh, that is uh, uh, an accessible parking spot. On the south side from the east-west connector, there's also an accessible route both to the addition as well as to the courts. The next slide, which is slide 26, shows the paving materials that have been chosen uh, for, uh, for this project. Um, in bright orange on the north, uh, um, Tower Plaza, you can see uh, permeable pavers. Um, and then all the sidewalk is shown in blue is basically concrete, a concrete sidewalk. Um, the courts that you see on the left on in the South Court are basically colored asphalt courts. And then uh, Dillon Drive on the South side is asphalt in the middle with um, 
pavers on either side. Tatiana, let me just uh, sort of add to your comment about Dillon Court Drive. Again, that staff comments recommended that it have advisory shoulders and the drawings that we submitted uh, at the time of submission did not have the advisory shoulders. But what Tatiana just explained is that it does have a, a change of paving to signal the advisory shoulders on the on the sides of that drive. So that'll be that'll be a, a really a kind of follow the principles of complete street design. Sorry for jumping in there. No, thank you. And also it makes it look narrower than it really is. <laughs> um, so um, the next slide, which is 27, uh, shows basically the uh, types of furnishings that we are using. So in bright red are benches for people to sit on and watch what's happening in, either in the um, Dillon Court or in the entry plaza, looking at the lobby entrance. Um, in bright orange, uh, uh, in uh, bright orange are just, um, you know, movable furnishings that are shown, uh, you know, right outside the entrances of both the lobby and the, and the new addition building. Uh, in blue, you see the railings that are accompanying all the stairs, mainly on the south side of um, the buildings. And, um, and then we have um, guardrails on the edges of the walls to prevent people from falling and then garbage cans. <laughs> yep. Okay, so bikes, uh, this is a big question today. The site has uh, 20 bike racks accommodating a total of 40 bikes. We, in addition to that, we are proposing um, 30 bike racks to accommodate an additional 60 bikes. So in total, when the project is complete, we will be able to accommodate 100 bicycles uh, on 50 bike racks. That was 28. Okay, uh, the tree removal plan is shown on slide 29. And, uh, you know, per the Princeton um, rules, uh, we, the we are paying attention to the eight, uh, to the number of eight or of trees that are over eight inch in diameter at breast height, total of which are uh, thirteen. And according to the calculation, which is in the yellow box at the bottom of the slide, um, we need to plant. Uh, uh, we need to plant. Um, uh, whoops! I, just, I think it's eighteen trees. Uh, and then, but we will be planting a total of 37. So the total of the total 37 trees that we're planting, we are planting six specimen trees that are shown in dark color uh, on the slide. And they are native trees, um, all of them. This is slide 30. This is slide 30, <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, okay. Slide 31 shows the, uh, the rest of the trees that we're planting um, and they are shown all in dark color for the 11 bark trees and in pink color for the 17 flowering trees. Um, most of, uh, some of them are native and others are not. We received questions about that and we have responses uh, if it comes up. Yeah, we can say right now that we're proposing mm. to change the ginkgos to a honey locust, right? Uh, yeah, we are. We uh, we have responses to your questions of changing this, and uh, if uh, the the ginkgos are not acceptable, we will replace them with the native honey locust, which <clears throat> does the both the things that we want. They have a bright color in the fall, and also their leaves will not be a problem for the courts. Um, also, we are proposing to replace the, if the prunus, uh, which is a, a weeping cherry, is not acceptable, we are proposing to replace it with the native sourwood, which is Oxidendron arboreum, uh, which would replace the, that tree. The rest of the trees are native. <clears throat> the shrub plants, uh, the shrub planting are shown in a dark color. Uh, all on the north side as well as the south side and are all native plants. Um, this is slide 32. This is slide 32. <laughs> the next slide uh, shows the, that we have chosen to do grass planting. It's shown in dark um, areas around the building. Um, and um, 
they are all native grasses. Uh, there was a question uh, about why we are keeping a little strip <laughs> of mown grass along the sidewalk. And the reason is that this site over here um, hosts a bunch of events all year round. And this, um, and in order to keep the trucks and uh, that serve the events off Elm Drive, they would have to park on the sidewalk, but a little more in, so on top of the grass. Um, that would not be every day, of course, only during events. Like reunions. Like reunions, exactly. Right. This is slide 33 now, slide 34. Yeah, and slide 34 is the ground cover planting. All of it is native uh, to this region and uh, is shown in a darker color on the slide. Um, I want to point out that on the north side of Dillon Drive at the bottom, um, an elm tree, 30 inch in diameter, was just cut down recently because it was three quarters dead and it's not shown here. Um, we were asked if we could replace it with something and we are proposing to replace it with a, um, with a swamp white oak corcus bicolor. Great. Um, okay. Slide 35. Slide 35 shows what uh, is on the roof. So basically on top of the new addition, we're putting an intensive green roof because the roof can support it. And on the um, existing um, Stephen wing, we are putting an extensive uh, green roof because the roof is old and cannot take uh, much more than an extensive green roof, which has less soil in it. Um, and uh, the plants are just not as heavy. And uh, this is a little bit of a rendering from the Northeast showing how uh, the walkways lead you to the new entrance to the building and the lobby. And that's slide 36. Slide 37 shows again how you would arrive from the north with the tower on your right hand side uh, towards the new lobby entrance. And the parking uh, for one handicap is on the left. And from the south on slide 38 is how you would come from the south and Dillon Drive down into the, the uh, open court and the entrances to the, uh, to the addition on the ground level. I think these are all the slides. We're going back to slide 39, which shows the site plan as a whole uh, with all the spaces around the new buildings. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tatiana. Slide 40 is a transition slide to stormwater design. I'm going to hand it off to uh, Christian and he'll walk us through these slides and just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Sure. Do I need to be qualified? Chris? Yes, you do. Yes, you <laughs> You've been sworn in, but um, if you can give us some of your educational and uh, qualifications, that'd be great. Sure. So I have a bachelor's degrees in civil engineering and business from Lehigh University as well as a master's degree in civil engineering from North Carolina State. I've been practicing land development engineering in New Jersey for approximately 17 years. At this point, I'm professionally licensed in New Jersey as well as several other states. And I've appeared before numerous boards in the state of New Jersey previously. I believe I've been in front of this board once or twice and have been qualified as an expert previously. Thank you, we accept your qualifications. Thanks so much. So starting with slide 41, as others have mentioned earlier in this presentation, the, the project site's centrally located in the campus. It's a little over two acres and it's generally presently occupied by the Dillon Gym building, as well as two temporary trailers, asphalt coverage, and some limited pervious or limited grass areas on site. Under the current conditions or existing conditions, when it rains, runoff sheet flows into existing pipe stormwater conveyance system. That conveyance system conveys the runoff south. It eventually discharges to a tributary adjacent to Elm Drive, and then that tributary continues to flow the stormwater to the south into Lake Carnegie. Ron, if you don't mind going to slide 42. Zooming in a little bit closer to look at the existing conditions on site, one thing that jumps out immediately, as I stated a little bit earlier, is the limited amount of pervious or grass cover on the site. In its entirety, around only 15% of the existing site is pervious. And I'll also state that there is no existing water quantity, water quality, or groundwater recharge measures 
present on the site as it exists today. We thought it would be beneficial to provide a side-by-side -side view of the existing site and the proposed conditions. One thing that should immediately jump out is that as part of this project, we're proposing to reduce the existing impervious coverage compared to existing site conditions. This reduction is on the order of 6% when you consider the site as a whole and not including the green roofs. Once you consider the green roofs, that number jumps up significantly, um, whereas the impervious coverage gets reduced to around 67%. I'll note from a regulatory perspective, the reduction in pervious coverage from existing conditions to proposed conditions would alone meet the municipal and state requirements for water quality, groundwater recharge, and water quantity. However, we're going above and beyond by still proposing stormwater management measures as part of this project. So Ron, if you don't mind on slide 43, talk about these measures in a little bit more detail. So what we're proposing as part of this project starting from the north in the northeast corner of the site. We're proposing a porous paver area within the plaza. That area will be approximately 3,000 square feet. We're also proposing the two green roofs that was mentioned previously. The green roof on the eastern portion of the site will be an intensive excuse, green roof. Excuse me, excuse me. I'm getting a lot of static. I don't know if anybody else is. Yeah, no? Christian, Christian, you're sounding like Darth Vader. So I think oh, I'm um, sorry. it might be your I don't know if you're using headphones, if your battery is low, but uh, let's just try it again. Your distance from the mic. Yeah, I'll get closer. Is this any better at this yeah, point? Yeah, much, much better. Much yes. Better. Yeah. I, I apologize for the awkward view of my face for the next few minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll <do it. laughs> so, so I'll restart with the proposed stormwater management measures. And if I have to jump back and cover anything else, please let me know. So what we're proposing relative to stormwater management measures in the northeastern portion of the site. We're proposing porous pavers, which will have an area of around 3,000 square feet. We're proposing two green roofs. The green roof on the eastern portion of the site will be an intensive green roof, which will provide some storage for us from an attention perspective. And the green roof on the western portion of the site over top of the existing structure will be an extensive green roof. In addition to that, we are proposing some grass conveyance swales around the new building expansion. And then lastly, we're proposing some infiltration trenches in the southern portion of the site where we're making our downstream connection to the existing conveyance systems. So what this means to us from a, a more quantitative perspective, going through the water quantity, water quality, and groundwater recharge criteria, starting with water quantity. As I noted earlier, there's no water quantity measures currently on the site. What we're proposing through the implementation of these four stormwater management measures is to reduce the amount of volume of stormwater runoff leaving the site. And this is mainly done through the green roof and the porous pavers. By providing on-site storage, we will be reducing the amount of runoff for the 210 and 100 year storm. From a volume perspective, during a two year storm, that volume will be reduced on the order of 30%. For the 10 year storm, it'll be reduced on the order of 20%. And then for the 100 year storm, that volume will be reduced on the order of 13%. Relative to water quality, there's no present water quality treatment on site. We will be providing water quality treatment through the proposed construction of the porous paving system in the northern section of the site, as well as through the infiltration trenches in the southern portion of the site. And then lastly, from a groundwater recharge perspective, given that the majority of the site today is impervious, there's not a lot of opportunity to support groundwater recharge. We anticipate with the proposed stormwater management design, we'll increase the site area that has the ability to recharge by fivefold. And the way we're doing this is through the construction of the porous paving areas, as well as the downstream infiltration trenches. So that's the high level overview with stormwater management. The last thing I'll note is that we did receive comments from the municipal stormwater management consultant, and we have no objection to complying with his commentary. Chris, there was also a comment in the landscape uh, architect's report asking about the the infiltration trenches and that we can shift them or move them as far away as possible from the uh, landscaping? That's correct. We did locate the infiltration trenches to try and avoid trees. There was a comment about trying to provide additional clearance from the infiltration trenches and the trees, and we have no objection to working with the landscape professional in order to do so. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. All right, now on slide 44, I'm gonna to transition to a description of the building character and materials. Slide 45 shows uh, the, the site in the context of um, 
the existing campus buildings. It's interesting that uh, to the north, the vocabulary is one of uh, stone, primarily argillite stone, including obviously Bill and Jim itself. And then to the east of the site is really the uh, portion of the campus which is uh, which is brick. Uh, and then the, the pink piece on the left is the IMP uh, modern buildings, which are which are concrete. So it primarily sits in a in a context right at the intersection of the stone campus and the the brick campus. Slide forty six is a ground level view, very similar to the uh, aerial view that uh, Tatiana showed. We're looking at the uh, tower plaza, the existing uh, tower of Dylan Jim, and the the new entrance um, to to the rec center in the renovated squash courts. And you can see the addition just kind of peeking out uh, on the left part of the part of the slide. Uh, slide 47, uh, it's the same view, but now we're on the right hand side of the slide, we've added that historical view of Brokaw Arch that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the historical memory of that arch. And it, it was, as I said, when the, when the squash courts were built, uh, so an important vista down through campus uh, was lost and this new addition and the opportunity to create an arrival plaza and a new entrance into the campus rec facility. It doesn't imitate it, it's not intended to imitate that, but it carries the memory of that uh, arch. And most importantly, it's a, a symbol of arrival. Um, and uh, this is the preferred place of arrival um, for, for the students into the, into the facility, brings them in at the level of the building that's accessible, uh, at the level of the building that has the um, uh, uh, locker rooms and it creates a, a kind of uh, appropriately scaled and present um, entrance portal. On slide 48, uh, this is the, was the early slide in the presentation. Now we're looking to the east. As I mentioned, the glass on the glass pavilion is a bird safe uh, design. You're seeing the green roof on top. Uh, you'll see a, um, a perforated metal panel here. I should have pointed out, I'm gonna go back two slides, one, one slide to 47. As I'm going to show, show you some materials in a bit. You'll see two types of metal. There's a kind of uh, grayish metal around some accent pieces, such as the front entrance, and there's a more bronze colored me uh, metal that is the uh, perforated screen that provides the passive energy strategies and knocks down the sun and provides sun control on the glass pavilion. So in a minute, I'll show you some samples of where we're headed on those, on those materials. Slide 49, these are really sort of diagrams of the of the building. They're both in the, uh, on the left is the existing uh, space between those trusses that form, that used to form the squash courts. And we're looking to the south. I pointed out some small ventilation uh, openings in the, that wall. These are dramatically new windows that provide daylight and views uh, from the, from this exercise area. And on the right, uh, the panoramic view that is um, part of the uh, glass pavilion addition at the southeast corner of the site. Now I'm on slide 50. Uh, these are precedent examples of the type of perforated metal panel that we're uh, studying, currently studying for the, the passive solar control around the perimeter of the glass pavilion. So you see a variety of different examples here. Uh, the Smithsonian Museum uh, of uh, uh, African American history and culture at the lower left, and some other examples. So it'll it'll be a very transparent, uh, very uh, filtered light from the inside, but from the outside, it will do the job of uh, uh, knocking down the sunlight and maintaining solar control in the pavilion. Slide 51. Um, this is what I was talking about as we talk about materials. This is a, a recent mock-up we did uh, late in the fall as we began to identify materials for the building. On the right hand side, you'll see a lot of different brick mock-ups and you'll see this orange box over a handful of those mock-ups. That's the current um, uh, direction. We're gonna build full larger scale mock-ups of these different panels, but we're trying to find uh, through the use of brick, which is one of the materials in this part of the campus, a general color and tone that would be sympathetic to the uh, to the very multicolored stone of, of the Dylan gem. So that's the that's the direction we're heading on the materiality of the brick. On the left, you'll see a couple of arrays of uh, different metal panels. I mentioned we had a, a gray colored panel for some of the accents and a more bronze colored panel for the perforated metal screen. And you'll see here again, a rectangle around the, the gray colored panel, which is the direction that we're heading 
for the accent panels, and then a couple a couple samples that we're looking at for the for the perforated metal panel. We'll teach take all these uh, mock-ups one step further to refine them, but these give you a very good idea of the the kind of direction that we're going with the building materials and some of their color characteristics. Now on slide 52, I'm going to, this is going to be the beginning of a series of renderings around the building just to fully kind of complete the picture, give you a sense of what it's like. We're now here at the southeast corner of the pavilion. You'll see the brick base. You'll see the floor to ceiling height glass. You'll see the mass timber construction of the ceiling, the perforated metal that uh, sun protection and some fins here that also help provide sun control for the pavilion. Uh, to, off to the left is the outdoor court. As we move around to that left-hand side, you'll see the accessible ramp that Tatiana talked about. You'll see the Dillon Court Drive on the left. Um, and this is going down to the outdoor recreation area. You'll see the tall grasses and landscapes. Now, uh, slide 54, we're uh, now on Dillon Court Drive. We're looking to the north, looking, uh, this is that wonderful site where the trailers currently are. And now this is the transformation of that site into the outdoor basketball court, the larger windows, and the, the, the south face of uh, Dillon Gym and with the, the pavilion off to the right here. Now on slide 55, we're now on the western side of the building. And the only thing you'll see here is this, um, uh, the elevator cab overrun. I mentioned the elevator that provides accessibility on this western part of the building, uh, a lobby for that elevator cab and an exit for that roof, rooftop uh, fire, fire escape that goes over the top of the roof of uh, Stevens Fitness. And slide 56 now, we're looking back to the west. And this is the reconstruction. This is say, the new construction of the stair that's part of that uh, emergency egress system. And what we've done is um, made it a bit more compatible to the existing building. So we've picked up the bay system and are trying to kind of just do a quiet, uh, lightweight design that provides the fire escape, but also a bit of a concealing concealment around that. So it doesn't, doesn't expose just a kind of uh, functional fire stair. So it fits into the base system and the color of the, of the building. Slide 57, uh, this is uh, focusing on the variance that was mentioned for some signage. Uh, we do, although this is a, a kind of facility that the students will come to know very quickly, we do want to provide a clear wayfinding as part of the campus wayfinding system. And uh, uh, we have a, a small monument sign that sits out uh, by the roadway so that it can be seen clearly from the road. Um, and so that's one of the one part of the variance request. And then uh, another uh, um, mounted sign in the opening of the new entryway and the details of that are provided up on the upper right and on the, the lower right of, of this slide. Uh, 50, slide 58 is a, is a detail showing the size of the lettering. The lettering is about four inches uh, tall. Um, and uh, you'll see the overall uh, area of the, of, the, of the signage here. Of, uh, the hatch area is 16 square feet uh, on the signage panel. Slide 59, a few slides just of the interior character. This is, uh, we're in the, the sort of entry lobby. To the left is the, the, the sort of new portal door that looks to the north up Elm Drive. This is a student social space that'll be furnished nicely to accommodate um, hanging out and lounging in community. We're looking at the inside face of a, of a stone wall. This will be a sort of uh, using some of the, reusing some of the existing stone to patch and patch patch this wall together. A few discrete openings that provide daylight and another opening that provides views back to the campus. The existing structure in here is part of the existing lightweight steel structure that's part of the squash wing. As we move into the glass pavilion, you'll see the mass timber, uh, a stair and elevator core in the middle of the slide and the panoramic vistas and the sun control around the perimeter. You also see the, the fans that will, will sort of move the air around the space for a passive energy strategy. Down below that space uh, is, a, is the uh, group fitness space, two fitness spaces that can be um, separated or combined into a single space. And those open out to the west, to the Dillon court and the basketball courts. And then this is the slide 62, a rendering of the repurposed existing squash courts. As I mentioned at the beginning, these are the trusses that are spanning over the swimming pool. They create a really wonderful light, open, airy uh, uh, structure 
for all the fitness and equipment area of this part of the of this part of the design. And slide 63 is a uh, the building at sort of twilight to give it, it. It has a fantastic presence on the campus, amazing vistas out to the south and the west, and it, it really will be a, a beacon. Uh, for campus life and health and wellness on the Princeton campus. So that's the end of our um, presentation. I'm happy to, um, the team is happy to take questions and we can come back to any of these slides that uh, you feel would be helpful to help illustrate responses. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCoy. Um, uh, questions from board members? I, okay, Mr. Taylor. I'm first of all, extremely impressed with the presentation. As someone who over the years has spent a lot of time at Dylan Jim, <laughs> it's personally important to me, Mr. McCoy, that you still have kept the squash courts is especially important. And I remember all the concerts I've attended over the years, including the last with probably the Blue Man Group. <laughs> Thank you. The ways in which the values that you've employed in, in designing and, and, and implementing the program. What I'm interested in, generally speaking, is what, if any, impact does the new Dillon Gym and ultimately over time this growth corridor have on the relationship between Princeton University and the services, the relationship of the city. I see the reference to stormwater, but do you have any, any sense you could share with us? What is the impact on our services? What's expected? The relationship between the town, the municipality as a result of a major piece of new construction? Um, I'm wondering if uh, Christopher, uh, others might be able to help me with this one. Um, we, um, as the campus grows, we take responsibility for the services of our, of our own facilities. We have our own volunteer fire department. We uh, have our own stormwater management system on the campus. It does tie into the regional storm, stormwater management. Uh, but I don't, is there something sp specific about services that, that, um, that you're um, uh, interested in? We do our own trash removal. Um, so I don't think this has a burden on the municipal services. That, that's really what I'm looking for. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not entirely. I'm not. I'm not as clear as mm -hmm. I am now on the nature of of how you're proceeding at the university. We're to, pretty self pretty self sufficient. Self sufficiency is is the methodology. Mm -hmm, I get mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Uh, Zenon has uh, Mr. Tex already has his hand raised. Oh, sorry, Zenon. Yeah. Please go ahead. No worries. I just put it up. So um, I have a few comments to make. I mean, this is really um, an amazing project. I mean, that last rendering really is beautiful. Um, although I guess maybe I'll start with um, uh, one of the points that PEC uh, raised in the memo was whether or not the outdoor lighting will be dark sky compliant. I'm not sure how that will affect the aesthetic, but I mean, it was pretty pretty nice looking, but I guess that's the first question. I have a, a bunch of others also. So yeah, renders always try to you know <laughs> make the the sky uh, dramatic, but all the fixtures will comply with the lead um, requirements for uh, exterior lighting. Okay, great. And actually, that that's a good segue to my next question. So one of the big things that um, was brought up in the memo was um, whether or not the project could be uh, lead platinum or living building challenge standard um, 4.0. Um, and I wasn't sure, was that explored and uh, is it possible to, to reach that? Um, we're not able to reach the, the lead platinum or the living building uh, challenge, um, but I think that projects like this, which, will, which is lead, lead gold and will maximize the points it can uh, achieve within the lead system, are also part of the overall, you know, campus sustainability strategies to be carbon neutral by uh, uh, 20, uh, 36, 2046. And this, this building will be fed by the new geo exchange system that will be on the central campus. 
Um, so that'll be part of our part of our pathway toward carbon carbon neutrality. And it is also will take advantage of the uh, increase of solar, which feeds the campus and will provide 20% of the electrical power on campus. And those are those those campus wide systems are systems that don't you, you can't take into consideration when calculating the lead for the specific building. So they go, you know, they're they're very sustainable strategies. They just don't uh, fit into the lead accounting system. Okay, thanks for explaining that. So, um, as far as uh, heating is concerned, and and other systems, it, will the building and expansion be uh, all electric? Is there any um, fossil fuel um, use other than for? I guess it's. I don't know if there's going to be a backup generator, but I guess it was mentioned. I'm going to ask um, our design team to get the details on this. So either Jarrett or Mark, could you respond to that? Because I don't know if I have all the details of that. Sure, I can take that. So the, um, as Ron said, we, we, are, we are looking at a new geo exchange system for the entire campus. It's a massive undertaking. It's going to take a long time to implement. We have the, the new addition for Dylan will be on the new geo exchange hot water system. It's going to take some time to convert the rest of the building over. There are, there are plans to do it. There's just not a specific timeline yet. So besides the new generator, all the new work is, is not going to have any fossil burning equipment. The old equipment will have to remain in service for a little while longer, but eventually we'll turn over to the uh, new hot water system. What is, what is the um, Ms. existence? Uh, oh, uh, is that a, for a second. I miss missing. Have you, or have you, have you been qualified? Oh, no. Yeah. Chris, Christopher, if you could do that. Yeah, he's, um, he's um, uh, not a, not a consultant. He's a university. His, his position is project manager. Jared, what's your official title? I'm senior project manager with the senior Office of project Capital manager. Projects. Oh, I see. Okay, that's fine. So you're, you're a test finance and fact witness, which is Correct. fine. Thank Correct. you. So uh, just out of curiosity, what is the current uh, building heated with, uh, or how is it oil or it's, gas? It's no, it's uh, it's on gas. the existing steam system, oh, which steam comes system. up from from our our plant down south. Of the okay. Building. okay. All right, so that I guess that system will eventually be phased out, but I guess it's still yes, the steam will be phased out eventually. Okay, that's good to know. Um, some other comments were um, about having electric charging at the ADA van access parking stall, and then also having um, electric charging at the bike racks at some of the bike racks for um, electric bicycles, and then also covered. Um, I guess bike parking as well, so that way, um, you know, the bike bike bikes can stay dry, and, and you know, uh, not covered right. in snow during the winter. So um, I'll try to take. I'll start with the last bit first. The existing Dillon Gymnasium has uh, uh, covered bike parking inside, and those those serve to meet the lead requirements for the points that we're seeking for this for this project. Um, in terms of um, uh, the you, can you you had a question about oh, the EV charging for the uh, the uh, um, ADA slot? Um, what this is similar to the art museum. We had a similar conversation when we presented uh, the art museum. The the parking space is not a long term parking space, and uh, if it was a long term space, that would be more appropriate for the EV charging. As a short term parking space. Um, it is not appropriate to put this uh, EV charging here. And the university is also in the middle of advancing a new, um, more robust uh, campus-wide system for EV parking in all of our, in our, in our parking lots on the east and west parts of the campus. We also have a person, uh, a sort of support system for individuals with uh, permanent or temporary disabilities that'll be, that started in the fall of 2021. And that includes point-to-point -point transportation if someone would, would want that. So we, we are, are trying to really uh, eliminate parking from the center part of the campus. And it goes back to the point I made about keeping Elm, trying to make Elm Drive more pedestrian friendly. And so the parking here would be short-term and this is not, we don't think this is what we want to have, uh, encourage long-term parking with a, with a uh, EV charging station. What about um, with the electric bikes? And, and electric bikes, um, 
we are, um, you know, trying to figure out electric bikes. Uh, we know with electric scooters that students charge those charge them in their rooms, uh, so they don't they don't charge on campus. The you know the electric scooters at nighttime go into the rooms and the students charge them. With electric bikes. Um, we are exploring a, a, a fleet system, but even in that fleet system, the bike charging unit is removed from the bike and it's, char it's just replaced. And so students, if they have electric, electric bikes, would do the same thing. They will, t they will take off the electric charging unit and take it into their room overnight and charge, charge it in their room overnight. So we don't think it's a, a kind of good use of our resources to provide things that we don't have any evidence would be, that would be used at this point. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that at least probably inside, it would be good to have some outlets accessible. I mean, I don't think that would be a very difficult thing, but I don't know what the system is. So, um, My last point is actually not really um, environmental related, but it's more just kind of a functional, functional question or comment about the basketball court outside. It's great that you're, you're creating a basketball court outside as somebody who likes to play basketball outside. Um, you know, I, I think that potentially having um, hoops on the sides and so not just having two on each end, um, but, you know, potentially more would allow for, um, you know, more people to be able to play because especially on a nice day during the, the spring or the even the summer or fall, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people want to be playing outside. So I think that adding extra hoops would probably make more sense. So. Let me ask Jeff Graydon if he has, Jeff is um, the world's most knowledgeable person on student athletics. And that's slightly, a slightly exaggeration, but Jeff knows things about how our campus uses these facilities. And I'm wondering, Jeff, if you've thought about that, which does sound like an interesting suggestion. I think it's an interesting suggestion, but we currently don't have any basketball hoops on campus. So this is a major increase of what we don't have on campus right now. I think it's something we could look at, but I'm not certain that we would do it. I'd also say that we're trying to encourage um, the space around the court for other kinds of outdoor recreation activity, and they don't probably don't want to have basketballs sort of uh, wandering through those through those through those areas. And also, the uh, orientation of of the east and west sides is not very good for sun. So, you know, these are right. we'll, we can look at this, and we can obviously adapt over time. But uh, yeah. as, as, as Jeff said, this is a, a step forward for us right now. And we, we, we do think it's going to be very popular. Yeah, just a suggestion. So. Yep. Thank you. Uh, other questions from board members? I have a couple thoughts. Um, first of all, it, I, I think it's, I'm just very interested to hear about the transition that's going to be made um, on Elm Drive to make it really a pedestrian bike, just, you know, simply yeah. not vehicular <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or minimally vehicular mm -hmm. um, uh, you right. know, transit way. So mm -hmm. that I, I, I'm really glad to hear about that. With regard to the trees and the ginkgos and, and weeping cherries, my, my personal preference would very much be to go with native species. Um, certainly with the weeping cherry, the ginkgo I think is interesting because I mean, to me, I sort of give ginkgos a pass since they've been around since the dinosaurs. I, I sort of assume that they're, you know, semi-native everywhere. <laughs> that Pangea or Gondwana land was. <laughs> but, uh, but I am curious about why they'd have been a choice um, in, in the view of landscape architects, you know, preferable to um, locust, uh, you know, what makes them in your eyes better? I'll, uh, I'll say a little bit about that, but then Tatiana and Stone can jump in also. Um, Jeff Graydon, who is just speaking to us, um, is always a kind of voice of conscience when we have trees near playing surfaces. And the ginkgos have the magic ability that seems like they shed all of their leaves in 24 hours. Mm. Uh, and, and yeah, so it's like a big dump of, of leaves. You clean it up and then you're done. You're not cleaning up leaves over a period of time. So that 
and plus they have spect absolutely spectacular color and we have some majestic ginkgo ginkgos all over campus they certainly are, are are everywhere and they're really really wonderful so from an aesthetic point of view uh it's a nice marriage of aesthetics and functionality that we can have a kind of quick dump of leaves clean them up and then and then not have to not have to sweep them up all, all the time um, that being said, if 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 the advice is to go to the to the honey locusts, those are those are a, a similar choice, same color, beautiful color, uh, and similar leaf fall that is not dragging on for months uh, through the winter. So it's an interesting balance. So as we said, Tatiana said that we've identified alter alternates. If that's the recommendation. Yeah, I, I have nothing to add, Ron. That's <laughs> pretty well, yeah, fabulous. Are... I do agree with <laughs> Louise, though, that ginkgos are special. I mean, they look silly when they're little, but as they grow, I mean, they look like, you know, gangly teenagers when they're little, but as they grow, they become fabulous. And yes, they are ancient. Um, they are very interesting botanically. And, you know, it's true that the Princeton campus has a history of collecting very interesting botanical trees as well as native trees. So they do have special trees. For the cherry, um, it is, I mean, if you walk around the Princeton campus in spring, you will notice there are a lot of cherries and magnolias that are all in bloom and they help the students through their exams. <laughs> uh, you know, in the spring after a very cold, long winter, um, all these flowers are really important and there are very few native trees that, you know, there are small ones like, you know, the, you know, dogwoods and the Circus canadensis and, you know, um, these, but, you know, the cherries are special on the campus. So we thought they would be nice here, but that's fine. You know, Oxidendron is special in another way. So I was thinking that maybe I'm misunderstanding. So you're, you're suggesting something other than amelanchia. I thought that is what you were. No, it's Oxidendron. It's Oxidendron, which is common um, name. Oh, it's uh, the common name uh, is uh, sour sour wood. Sour wood. Yeah. Oh, a sour wood. Oh, I yeah. <laughs> you like it? Yes, yeah, special uh, <laughs> special fondness for sour wood, but <laughs> okay, also Juneberry or sh <laughs> shad bush or so, you know because there are those other. Yeah, they're uh, not a as little big. bit later in the spring, but spring yeah, yeah. flowering that have really, really strong wildlife value. And that that's what the, the tips the scales for me anyway with these native species is the the value they bring to, to oh, insects definitely. and songbirds. Um, definitely. And that's just such an important thing, you know, if the if the um ginkgos over time soak up a ton more water you know, that could be a factor. And yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to be just, you know, completely immovable on that point. But, um, but it's for fine. sure, I think a, a choice other than weeping cherry, especially since there are a lot of them already, and they just have, you know, very little wildlife value. I, are I you think. okay with the sour wood? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because it's they're very appropriate special. appropriate for, um, for, I mean, I know they're difficult to transplant, not to get totally into the weeds. Um, <laughs> well, we'll uh, start very small, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. We'll start them small and uh, Princeton has this most incredible team, um, you know, <coughs> they're very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the other question I had, you talked about a strip of grass uh, along Elm Road um, and, uh, and that it was an important place for for vehicles to be able to pull over partly onto the grass and park. And I wondered whether there was, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but whether you have a plan to reinforce that there and sort of potentially make it a pervious, but vegetated, you know, whether there's some either um, plastic or concrete or some kind of pervious paver. Yeah, it is, it is, it is a reinforced, yes, it's reinforced but it's going to look um, like grass. Um, right, okay. So it's reinforced turf, essentially. 
So basically when nothing's happening, you will look like a, a strip of lawn or like, you know, <laughs> and, and does it when, drain? Does it serve? A, yes, a it's completely pervious. Yes, it's completely pervious. Okay, permeable. great. Good. That was that's what I wanted to know. Um, great. So Mr. O'Donnell. Yeah. Uh, will the fitness center be 24 hour operation? And actually, the, I guess the question is, will the lighting be? on all night or will it be shut off at some point? Or I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna let Jeff answer both of those, both those questions. Okay. So, so no, the fitness center is not a 24 hour fitness center. Um, the hours do vary and, and it just like clubs, it waxes and wanes during different times of the year. Um, the outdoor lights, um, will not be on 24 hours, but there may occasionally be a late night activity on the basketball courts, but they will not be 24 hours. We, we simply can't man things 24 hours. There, there may be one fitness night a year that you know is an all nighter, but this would not be a routine. Okay. And will and there be any lighting in the fitness center itself overnight or will it, it be totally dark? Uh, we do have, we, there are LEDs and they're there probably there will be some very low level of lights, just like in Jad when there's two or three on the main on the main floor. It's security lighting in the evening when we're closed. Thank you. And just uh, as a former basketball player who mm -hmm. spent more time tracking down his bad shots than actually mm -hmm. scoring, I hope those grasses uh, at the south end of the uh, the court are uh, sturdy enough or hardy enough to withstand balls and players going in to, to, to retrieve their, their uh, earned shots. Yeah, Tatiana put a lot of thought into that landscaping. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, Dandra Bomilski, I noticed you activated your camera. Did you have anything to add about landscaping or tree choices? I, I did not. I just said when you started talking about the ginkgos, I figured I'd make sure you know I am here listening. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, Ms. Capazzoli. I just really wanted to compliment the university on the um, revitalization, revitalization of Dylan Jim. And I think the addition really complements it. It's a great thing to see iconic university buildings, um, you know, revitalized and they're certainly appreciated. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're here, thank you. Uh, Mr. Quinn. Just uh, just to echo what Julie said and, and ask a question, uh, fitness and sports will be the only use of the gym. Uh, many of us have uh, fond memories of concerts at, at Dillon. Um, is this primarily just for fitness and sports use? Not exclusively. We still have some events in the Dillon gym floor. Uh, so Jeff, you can maybe give a little bit more detail on that. I do not expect there'd be any increase in non-university events, but there are non-recreational events, but there's a vendor fair, there's the black and orange ball. Um, some events will be moving over to our lake campus where we will have a convening space, but um, I don't believe you would notice any change in events. Certainly uh, not, not increase. Not bringing the great what's left of the Grateful Dead back to town, <laughs> uh, the legendary 1971 concert. There. I do believe the Tokyo String Quartet is scheduled sometime in April. Oh, wonderful! No. What what are they playing? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, other um, other questions from board members before we go to public questions and comments. Okay, I'm not seeing any. So um, to members of the public, I'll open up um, the meeting to hear uh, from you. If you have questions or comments, um, please virtually raise your hand. Um, and Ms. Phillip will, will um, bring you over to be a panelist. Um, and uh, we'll give you your three minutes to weigh in. I'm not seeing any, oh, wait a minute, my thing is all the way down here. 
Oh, I'm, I'm not seeing any hands raised um, as of now. So I'll repeat, anybody wish to speak about this or pose questions to the university or any of its representatives? Okay, I don't see any, so I will close the public comment um, on this application and go back to board members. Any final comments, any questions, or would someone like to make a motion? Um, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the application as presented. Second. Okay, Mr. Muller, um, do you wanna thank you both, moved by Ms. Capazzoli, seconded by Ms. Sachs. Mr. Muller, do you wanna go through conditions? I think that would include at least one change to the proposed landscape plan <laughs> um, and possibly two. And there were also some conditions that were outlined in the um, memo from engineering and zoning staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this would be preliminary and major final site plan approval, preliminary and final ma uh, major site plan approval with two, uh, two sign variances run. Um, yeah. and, those right. set, and those are set forth on slide, is it 37, something like that. Um, I think also a waiver that's requested from not some waivers so they don't have to submit a narrative on the, um, 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 on the site development. And then uh, conditions that the board might want to consider. First is we <coughs> have that traditional uh, condition with respect to the exhibit. This would be exhibit A1 that says the plan should be consistent with the, um, with the exhibit. Um, another traditional one we have is uh, one that says they can have, in, we can do with the university recently is an early start date. Um, and then um, the, let me just go through, those are the only ones I have on my, uh, my notes, but let me go through the uh, engineering and zoning report, or oh, the oral reports. Um, uh, Jim, with respect to three, uh, uh, Jim and Derek are both here? Yes? Yes. Yep. You know, Jim, in fact, yes, let me, sir. Let me, let me swear both of you, and if you both could raise your right hands. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. I do. So swear mm -hmm. or I do. Now, under your um, memo um, 3.0 um, analysis of bicycle parking, is there anything we need to do with that? Um, I, I think that if they just added a, uh, a description of the expansion of the floor area and show how it comports with the ordinance um, requirements. If it was greater than 15%, there's a certain number of bike. I think they have sufficient bike parking, um, but there was no analysis to determine what would have been required. So if they just add that to the plans, that would be great. Okay. Simple table. So Jim, just for clarity, we are doing the um, compliance with the ordinance on a campus-wide basis. And um, in this particular project, we're adding 60 spaces, so we're going to be well beyond. But it's really an, an issue of looking at the whole um, campus. And we do that report, um, I think our first one will be this spring. Um, so at that time, you'll see the whole campus and how it complies, including this facility and the expansion, and how it complies with the current ordinance. Um, but this, that, this that annual report that you're going to submit? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, that, that would be sufficient, Jerry. I don't think we need to put in a condition. Okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> okay, they've, they've agreed to all of the conditions and recommendations in the stormwater management report that Joe Scubian um, submitted. So I will just, I, I won't separately okay. identify them. I'll just no, you don't have to separately put those in. Right, I, I'll incorporate them all. And then in your 5.0 and 6.0, uh, construction cost estimate, um, higher level Typical. jurisdictions, yeah, the standard stuff, um, stormwater con uh, st sewer connection fees to be paid prior to building permits, escrow for um, inspections, 
So that's all I have for that. Michael is no conditions. Talked about stormwater management with respect to the man report. Um, I think they they submitted, uh, Christopher sent to me uh, shortly before the meeting uh, responses to the reports. And I think they agreed with everything in the man report. Let me pretty much, let me pull that. Um, stop, stop signs and stop bars should be shown in the plans. They agreed to that. Um, you should review a pedestrian crash data to confirm whether pedestrian safety enhancements are warranted along Elm, Elm Drive, Dolan Court Drive, and Pine Drive, and the university's responses. The university is currently undertaking a comprehensive review of pedestrian and personal mobility device use, bikes, and scooters, and safety on Elm Drive, and is evaluating the note of items as part of that effort. And that should be submitted, I would think, to you, Jim. Or should be submitted to uh, to Dan uh, McGinnis. Uh, it, it should be submitted as part of the as part of compliance or when it's ready. So so, they can... so let me if I could just respond to that. So along Dillon Court, there was a recommendation for stop signs and stop bars, and on both ends, and, and we've agreed to that. The that was number three. Number four asked for some more. Um, information on what we're going to do on Elm Drive, that's going to be part of a sort of a different study and project that's not yep. going to be timed with this. So we're looking at mobility up and down that entire corridor that's going to take some time. Um, as you know, we're pushing away from the cars on that area and we're looking at, you know, other types of, as um, explained by Ron McCoy, the scooters and the bikes and how it's all going to be related. And, those type of changes are going to be shown at that time, which will be so Christopher. That's a long ways off. It's not something imminent. Correct. It, uh, yeah, then, so then, 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 Jerry, I would say that that is not a condition for approval of this particular. I'm sure the university will share it with us when it's ready. Yep. yep. Right. And then um, next one is. Existing pavement markers on Dillon Court Drive indicate shared pedestrian and motor vehicle use. Um, the plans indicate uh, Dillon Court Drive should be resurfaced, but it's not clear whether a similar treatment would be used to indicate the shared use of the roadway. Um, basically, uh, what, what's suggested is consideration should be given to use pavement markings or differences in surface materials to separate the intended pass from motor vehicles and pedestrians in this area. And condition uh, con consideration should also be given to use a treatment for shared pedestrian motor vehicle areas that is consistent with the similar planned improvements on campus, such as the treatment proposed is part of the ESC's project, and they've agreed to do that. Then the next is plan should in indicate the location and construction details of all traffic control and directional signage proposed for the gym uh, expansion. They've agreed to do that. And then um, defer to the fire, uh, the, the suggestion by um, uh, by um, uh, by Dan uh, McGinnis is we defer to the fire, uh, municipal fire marshal to review the truck turning uh, pass to confirm confirm the accessibility and calculate calculation needs of emergency apparatus. They've agreed to that also. Then in terms of the landscape architect, um, Dan for number two, your number two, which was existing tree nineteen, much larger than described. Symmetrical complement to tree 17, and can you basically it appears it could be possible to, to preserve tree 19. Um, and basically, the university responded, and I just want to get your response to this maintaining existing Perosha Persica tree 19 was explored at length, but deemed challenging to protect during construction given the very close proximity to the building, existing building wall. New window openings will be added to the wall immediately behind the tree in order to make the existing enclosed and underutilized squash courts functional as a new access way, uh, as a new access main entry and lobby space with natural light. So their answer is they really can't, they don't think they can do that. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, yes, I am, I understand that. Okay, then uh, alternative shade tree. Uh, rather than elm tree, um, 69 could be replaced with a swamp white oak. 
Correct. which is native, native to this region. Everybody comfortable with the replacement? Okay, so that would be condition. Um, then, then we they already agreed to uh, to moving that you have the location alignment and you uh, yes and lim limits of stormwater infiltration trenches should be moved, et cetera. And they've agreed to relocate them as far as possible from existing trees. Um, then uh, the proposed landscape design will include two new spaces, um, but it's basically uh, you talk about the ginkgo and the and what was that movie where. Was it a ginkgo that stole my baby? Or was it, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was an I think it's the <laughs> dingo. <laughs> we watch different movies, Jerry. <laughs> uh, Carrie, we don't need that. What are we going to do with you, Jerry? You are hopelessly square. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, we, please okay, don't so put that in the minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Thanks for putting something. that image in my head. <laughs> a native replacement for ginkgo uh, could be honey locust, um, and then for the weeping uh, Japanese cherry, it could be uh, the sour wood. Do we want to make those, those substitutions? I definitely would like to substitute the sour wood. I would like to hear, Dan, any thoughts that you have about whether there's a reason that the ginkgo is preferable to... <laughs> to the um, locust either for size or form or water uptake or anything? I'd say based upon their design, I think the ginkgo would look better and, and serve the function of what they're trying to do better in that location. It's not native, but I think it would be better than the high locust. Okay, okay let's, so let's stick with the ginkgo like, and replace- And the, and the sour wood. Yes, yeah, so I, I actually think the sourwood would be a better selection also. Yeah. Personally. And then root, root barriers, um, then the environmental commission has a number of them. Uh, and let me go through them as quickly as I can. Um, the team will strive to achieve as many uh, credits as possible within the established lead framework. That's what they were willing to do. Uh, so why don't we make that a condition? Um, Do we want to say anything about the connection to the new uh, uh, hot water system? I don't know that we need to. You agree, everybody agree? Yeah, okay. Project is targeting lead gold certification, which would drive many of the metrics. So I think we should just put that in and um, well, about the exterior lighting in the dark sky compliant, um, the university says the project's exterior lighting design approach will minimize light pollution by specifying fixtures that meet the lead bug rating requirements. Um, all the uh, lighting will be LED and will be uh, designed to balance safety. Now they obviously, we had to, her testimony on the lighting system. Um, you wanna leave things where they are as proposed by the university? Everybody's okay with that? Okay. Yeah. Then, um, in accordance with uh, this, was a comment by the uh, PEC about soil compaction mediation and soil amendment. In accordance with state standards for soil erosion and sediment control, applicable soil compaction procedures will be implemented for the necessary grass landscape areas on site. So, we'll make that a condition. And then, um, the project aims to salvage and use portions of the existing exterior stone walls and squash. Uh, wood walls. We might as well put that in, and that's all I have on that. And I think that is all I have by way of conditions. Barry, just um, your reference to the lead. Uh, our focusing goal is to strive to achieve as many credits as possible, but I don't think that's a, appropriate for a condition. It's an outside agency also that we will apply for, so I don't think it's appropriate to condition any type of level or amount of credits. Um, we were talking about what our philosophy and goal is. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine with me. Everybody okay. on the board okay with that? Okay, so I'll take that out. So, let me just check. Um, check. I mean, the yeah. university has I represented that it has a commitment to that. It, it, yes. It's not right. aspirational, but it's also 
but it's a little more. <laughs> yeah, that's the way I take our, it. Mr. It's also beyond our control too. We we can't say yes, we yes. Go, you know, because it's a another process outside yep. of our control. Yeah. Okay. So that's that with the condition. So again, it's preliminary and final major site plan approval. The two variances, the waiver mm -hmm. from that narrative, and the conditions I just articulated. Okay, it was moved, I believe, by Ms. Capazzoli and seconded by Ms. Sachs. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Um, <clears throat> can we have a roll call vote, please, Carrie? Ms. Capazzoli? Yes. Mr. Chow? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. McGowan? Yes. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Mr. Texarney? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Motion carry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you yes, you. thank you. Thank and you. it really is an interesting and exciting project. And I, if I didn't make it clear before, I'll say now, thank you for making the site more absorbent. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, not just removing some of the impervious cover, but but absorbing more water on site um, than you have to under the law. It's really important. Great, I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Chair, if I could suggest that we take our break at this point. Yes, that is um, a great idea. So it's, it's 9.02. .02. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to be back at 9.10, okay? Thank you. We'll. Uh, We'll take an almost 10 minute break. <laughs> Thanks. Thank See you, you soon. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you. So we are turning now to discussion of an ordinance referral. This is ordinance number 2022-01. Um, disbanding the site plan review advisory board. This is an ordinance by the municipality of Princeton, disbanding the site plan review advisory board and amending the code of the borough of Princeton, New Jersey, 1974, and the code of the township of Princeton, New Jersey, 1968, accordingly. Um, Mr. Laplace, do you want to give us an introduction here? Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Princeton Council has referred to the planning board, this ordinance 2022-01, to disband the site plan review advisory board, uh, which we commonly refer to as SPRAP, and to amend the code of the borough of Princeton, 1974, and the code of the township of Princeton, 1968, accordingly. Um, introduced on January 10th of this year and scheduled for a public hearing at the council on January 24th, the purpose of this draft ordinance is to uh, abolish SPRAB in its current configuration and to make resulting modifications to Princeton's site plan and zoning regulations. The board has been asked to review and the planning board has been asked to review and consider this administrative change to the municipal land use development review process. Um, what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to talk about from a staff perspective. And as you know, we operate as a land use team here in the municipal complex, planning, engineering, historic preservation, um, our landscape architect, our other consultants, engineering consultants, we act as a land use team and it's a pretty extensive development review process, which when I came back to Princeton three years ago, I was very impressed with what was in place. Um, right now, SPRAB is obviously a step in that, um, along with lots of other uh, boards and commissions that give input and are part of the review process. So I just wanted to make a few comments to let you know that, first of all, staff, our land use staff, is unanimously in favor of this ordinance and has asked the council to seriously consider doing it. And here are some of the reasons why. Um, from a staff perspective, we really feel that um, at this point in time, Princeton, consolidated Princeton, has an impressive experienced in-house planning and engineering staff, which as I just said a few minutes ago, already undertakes a very extensive and multi-step development review process. And it starts sometimes way before an application is even submitted. 
we very often, sometimes weekly, at a weekly basis, meet with interested prospective applicants to the planning board and zoning board. Um, they come in, they talk to us, they bounce ideas off of us, they'll show us conceptual plans and sketches. And I think it's wonderful that Princeton has that tradition and culture already in place. And after that, we're, staff is always open to follow-up meetings, conversations, and then um, even after the applications are submitted, uh, the communication continues. Um, so I wanted to make that clear because I'm not sure everyone in the public, particularly in the community, understands how early the development review process begins. Um, we do feel, as it says in the draft ordinance, that SPRAB is a, a duplicative function. There's some redundancy in our process. Um, there are many boards and commissions that are already involved in addition to staff review. Um, Princeton's Environmental Commission does an extensive plan review and reporting, um, does that for all of our applications. As you know, this evening, the uh, application we just heard about Dillon Gymnasium, there were really some, some really good and interesting and extensive review comments from the um, Environmental Commission that the planning board obviously heavily considered and as did staff. Um, Shade Tree Commission reviews applications, the Historic Preservation Commission and our Historic Preservation Officer reviews applications as appropriate. Um, and again, the staff, we have planning and engineering in-house staff that do extensive review. So that all of that's taking place already. And um, we do feel, and we've had some feedback from the community that the perception of SPRAB, even though they've done a really impressive job of taking their role seriously, they've, they've really contributed a tremendous amount of energy and creativity and also time, personal time as volunteers to their, to their role. For the applicants and, and for the community as a whole, for the neighbors that show up for meetings and that they're worried, you know, concerned about certain applications, it, it's another step in the process that already has a lot of steps to it, a lot of people involved. It, I've heard people say that it almost feels like Princeton has two planning boards. It has a preliminary planning board, which SPRAB is sort of operating as, and it takes a lot of staff time and energy to provide the same support in terms of running the meetings and writing the reports and writing minutes and things like that. For SPRAB, it's almost equal to the time it takes for planning board. And as you know, planning board met 33 times last year in 11 months. So this is a very busy place for development review in, in New Jersey. Um, so there's that, that's, there's that thought. Um, and also, I think it's really important, particularly for, your, for this ordinance referral tonight to the planning board, to think about how our process of development review is in conformance with the municipal land use law. The municipal land use law, as you know, is our Bible. It's, our, it's the statute that gives the planning board its power and authority and, 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 and defines its role. And um, under the municipal land use law, the planning board has the power to set up a site plan advisory committee or to formalize a technical review committee, which is sort of how we're operating now on the staff side. Um, so there's lots of options to enhance and maybe even improve our overall site plan and design review operation here in Princeton. I think it's unfortunate because I've seen some things on social media and heard some things and had some telephone calls that people feel that abolishing SPRAB is a, is, is a retreat from from overall site plan and design review and that it's, it's, it's the planning board or the council saying that it's less important, I would argue it's very much the opposite. By us looking at how our site plan review process is working or maybe not working as efficiently as it could be, I think that says we're taking site plan and design review very seriously. Because if we weren't, we'd be just ignoring it and keeping the status quo. And from what I understand, SPRAB dates back quite a ways, certainly pre-consolidation before we have the present consolidated community of Princeton. So those are some of our thoughts. I also wanted to mention that there's been a lot of confusion and concerns with conflicts of interest because we have design professionals on SPRAB that also work locally or they have ties to applicants that come before the planning board eventually. So there's a lot of different issues um, and it's, it's a complicated board to, to, I can tell you from a staff perspective, it's, it's complicated to work with SPRAB because it really operates outside of the municipal land use law. And it's, um, it, it's time consuming, it puts a strain on our resources. And another thing that I wanna to bring to your attention, because as you know, probably the number one priority for the planning board and for the community coming up, I would think is undertaking this comprehensive update of our master plan this year, which is way overdue. And I have to tell you as the planning director, 
we really need to put our time and resources into that, in addition to doing our day-to-day -day planning board and other functions here. So to be able to maybe shift some of the time and effort that it takes to support SPRAB and to put it into not only if we have a reconstituted site plan entity like a committee of the planning board or a technical review board or whatever the planning board decides to do, we can do that. We'll also focus on this major task at hand, which will be the, the community master plan update. So those were some of my thoughts. And I wanted to leave everybody with this, kind of goes back to that concern about if SPRAB isn't with us and we have something else, is that a loss of quality of, you know, of, of what we're doing in terms of site plan and design review? And I would say it's not about the quality of site plan review of our site plan review process. It's, I mean, it is about the quality. It's not about the quantity. You know, it's not that we need this other step, this other level, which we currently have, which is FRAB, which so much mirrors what the planning board does. I think we can streamline the process and perhaps even have a better design review outcome. So those are some of the hopes and aspirations and concerns of staff. Yeah, can well, I jump thank in? Thank you for that. Uh, hey, can I, can I jump yes, in for please a go ahead, Jerry. Yep. Yeah. Um, just, just to follow up with what Michael was saying, a, a lot of towns are actually shifting from their SPRABs to what they call technical review committees, development review committees, which is pretty much what Princeton really is doing, although it hasn't been formalized as such. But it's basically where the initial design review, and it's not just the technical aspects, but the whole design is handled at the staff level where there's a lot, and before you have engineered plans, and before um, a developer gets locked in with plans and can go back and make some possibly significant changes. So th this is the, this is a trend you're seeing. It's, it's just one point I wanted to make. The second one is, uh, Michael talked about the consistency with the, the municipal land use or and operating outside it. One of the thing, one of the functions of SPRAB in the ordinance, the Princeton ordinance, is to classify um, uh, applications as minor uh, as, as as minor. It's clear that the municipal land use law gives that power to the planning board or a committee of the planning board appointed by the chair. Um, so that's the ordinance in any event would have to be um, amended to, to, to really correct that deficiency. Um, and, I, and it does. So I just wanted to mention those two things. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that this discussion uh, in recent weeks has highlighted, I think, and, and Michael touched on this, is the, the importance of um, developing a, an urban design element or community design element of the master plan. Um, because one of the things that I, I have appreciated in SPRAB uh, memos, and as, as I understand a big part of their function, is that design review, that architectural review. And I was glad to see, and I understand that design, in fact, I strongly believe design review is broader than architectural. Um, it, 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 it covers more than just the appearance of, of buildings, but um, I was pleased to see in the ordinance that it um, anticipates that uh, the planning board may, you know, take this up and, and create um, uh, a subcommittee or a, an advisory committee to the board that is um, advisory to us and under our wing, as it were. <laughs> um, and, but that is co closely coordinated with staff and, and maybe um, an early design and technical review that's that really is integrated. Anyway, I, I, I don't mean to jump ahead and um, opine on what might happen next. I'm just saying that um, uh, that I was pleased to see in the ordinance um, the, the door open <laughs> uh, and the expectation that planning board um, you know has a role here in in establishing some subsequent um, functioning committee or, or process that addresses the concerns that have been expressed by staff and legal counsel. Um, so are there uh, other, 
or, or questions that board members have of staff or Jerry about this. Um, I know there are members of the public who, who would like to um, address the board on this. And I see your hand Jared, up, can I, can I, Timer. Jared? Uh, and then oh, also sorry. Mr. Texarni. Um, go ahead, Michael. I was just gonna, I didn't know if, um, if our land use engineer and assistant municipal engineer, Jim Purcell, or if Derek oh. Bridger, our zoning officer, wanted to add to anything I said. I invariably leave things out. So I just wanted to know if they wanted to add anything. Jim, Derek? Derek had his microphone on first, so I'll let him go. No, I, I, I think Michael did a good job of, uh, you know, encapsulating the sentiment of staff and the legal uh, issues with SPRAB, and I agree with his uh, comments. Yeah, um, I'll also reiterate that uh, staff is unanimous in this uh, in this decision. But one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is that we are not in any way, shape, or form trying to get away from um, reviewing applications from a <clears throat> neighborhood character or aesthetics or architectural side of things. On the on the contrary, we want to work with. Um, the, with not just the planning board, but internally to develop uh, a, a set of standards that can be used so that there can be design standards and, and envisioning it to be an earlier, a much earlier process. Because what we see from uh, applicants now is that they're getting some tremendous suggestions from the site plan review advisory board, but it's way too late in the process. They've already spent tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars developing designs. And then they're faced with suggestions on changes that, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the SPRAB members feel like they're being ignored, but they're being ignored because there's a tremendous amount of effort that's already gone into a process. We would like to see more concept reviews come in uh, at which time we could do architectural design reviews um, and neighborhood character reviews before they go too far down the line and submit an application. So uh, I think that we would like to work with uh, members of the planning, planning board um, to see that there's another, there's an earlier step in the process, not a limit, you know, it's, it, I guess that's all I need to say. Yeah. And if I could jump in just for a second, and I agree completely with Jim about the necessity of having this done early on before a design gets baked in. Um, but one of the things that we need to do as we take steps down the process and figure out exactly how we want to do all this is to have a set of architectural standards, which we don't have now. We have in the context of the historic preservation ordinance, but nothing outside that. And we really need that um, from a legal point of view. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, uh, Mr. Cohen, I'll ask you to go first and then Mr. Bodekheimer. Okay, um, I, I wanna start out by saying that I'm completely um, supportive of the, the legal aspects of concern about the fact that in our ordinance, SPRAB is empowered to do certain things that it really shouldn't be doing under land use law. That was to Jerry's um, point. I think that I'm very supportive of what Jim was saying about bringing the design review earlier in the process. I think that's really important to make it as productive as possible. Um, but I do want to really emphasize that some of the alternatives that are being suggested, I don't see as um, really fulfilling um, the goal of SPRAB. If you look at the enabling ordinance for SPRAB, it calls for that group to be composed of, to the greatest extent possible, design professionals, landscape architects, planners, architects. Um, and there is a lot of expertise that's involved uh, in understanding design. And I don't think that it can be a subcommittee of the planning board because the planning board is composed quite differently. Um, we don't have that design expertise on this board now. 
um, and have not had it in my um, my time on the board. And uh, you know, I I I had the honor of. <laughs> Uh, taking over for Ms. Wilson at, at one point when Kim wasn't around because I was the most senior member of the planning board. So I've been around for a while and we just haven't had that design expertise on the planning board. Um, you know, staff wise, Michael's the only one who really has a design uh, background. And one of the things I think that's important about having a board with several members with design expertise is that there's a sense that, you know, design is subjective. And it's true that designers don't always agree with each other about what is good design. But when you get three or four or five designers in a room and they do all agree on a recommendation, that gives some credibility to the recommendation that's being made. And that's that's the way SPRAB has worked uh, over the years where, you know, there's a, there's a robust discussion and members of SPRAB will agree or disagree with each other. The things that make their way into the memo are things that the, um, that the board is unanimous on, things that one member agrees with and, you know, another member disagrees with don't make, it, don't make their way into the recommendations. So I think that's a really, really important um, aspect. And um, I think, you know, I'm agnostic about the need to disband SPRAB altogether and create a new um, entity. But what I am absolutely convinced about is that we need to have a design review entity um, that's composed of at least predominantly of design professionals. Um, I don't know even exactly what we're being asked to do tonight. I don't know if we're being asked to comment on uh, consistency with the master plan, but uh, I did a, a brief review and I came up with at least five goals uh, in the introduction to the master plan that make reference to design quality and, and character as being important things that uh, our master plan is supposed to be pursuing. And I think that if SPRAB is, um, you know, is dissolved without having a successor organization, um, I would feel completely convinced that it was not consistent with the master plan. So that's what I wanna say. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Bodekheimer, and then Mr. Quinn. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, see if I could fill in the blank that uh, that uh, Councilmember Cohen uh, referred to, which was the purpose of, of what it is that we're doing tonight. I could just, could, if, if we could just get a reminder of what our action is and what our, our finding is for the board members. Jody, while yeah, we from my understanding, I mean, straightforwardly, the council is asking the planning board to comment on this because it's a land use, it's part of the land use and development review process. And that's, that's obviously the planning board's jurisdiction. So the municipal council wants to hear from the planning board in terms of how this affects our de de development review process. It's really, this is different from a lot of the ordinances that you're asked to, you know, that are referred from council because a lot of them are about policies like this is about administration. This is about how we administer uh, land use review. So it's a little different from like uh, doing an overlay zone or some design, you know, changing to the zoning code or something like that. Um, I think Mr. Cohen, it was, it was good that David looked at the master plan and, and I'm glad that the master plan has many references to how important design is, good design, design review. And I think that's consistent with some of the points in this draft ordinance which says we need, we need to do that well, and there's other ways to do it that are consistent with the municipal land use law, which would be appropriate and proper and protect Princeton. You know, I, I think, I think SPRAB has been around a long time. So in a town like Princeton that wants to do things the best way possible, we should reevaluate our practices and the way we do things. I think that's just smart, a smart way to do things. So 
you're being asked to comment on is this ordinance a good idea, basically? And, and, and I'd say also, usually you do ordinance referral to see that something is not inconsistent with the master plan. So if you look at this ordinance and you look at the language about saying that SPRAW is to be abolished and the planning board has the ability to replace it with or change the design review process, you should consider whether that is you know, consistent with some of the goals and objectives of the master plan, which talks about good design review. If I could rephrase, is there anything about this action that is inconsistent with the direction of the master plan? I, I would, yeah, I would say in my professional opinion, no, because it talks about improving design review, you know, or, or that there's alternatives to design review. So in my personal professional opinion, I would say it is not inconsistent with the master plan. And it would be, if we did change, replace SPRAB with a different step in our review process, I would hope that it would be consistent with the municipal land use law. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quinn, and then Mr. McGowan, and then Mr. O'Donnell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and first of all, I, I just like uh, Julie and I, I think are the senior members of the board. And I, I've appreciated over the years uh, Sprab's reports. I find them illuminating. I would note for Mr. Cohen that on a, a couple of the reports had dissenting votes noted. So what we received was not always a unanimous report. Um, and I think that SPRAB as a conduit for other BCCs, for instance, when I was liaison to the Environmental Commission, the, Envir the Environmental Commission did not have a direct sit down with a developer as a commission. I don't know whether that's changed, um, but their review was strictly of the, of the materials that we as planning board members Received so SPRAB was sort of a a way for the Environmental Commission to get FaceTime with a with developers. So that all that said, and appreciating what my friend Mr. Cohen said uh, about design, I I think this is a good opportunity to first of all I think there's um, I find what the what the planner said compelling. I also think that whatever we do should be consistent with the MLUL. And I think there's an, I, like, uh, like the chair, I think I was happy to see that the ordinance anticipates um, something that follows SPRAB and, and what that is and how it works and whether it necessarily has to be limited to planning board members is worth exploring um, at a future date. And uh, you know, I, there are a lot of questions and there's, it's something that this board, whatever successor um, committee or entity is to borrow Mr. Cohen's term, I think it, it must clearly be under the umbrella of the planning board and not as a standalone um, BCC. But what that looks like, I think, is will be a great exercise for this board. Um, and and again, to echo what what David said, what Mr. Cohen said, Councilman Cohen said, um, I think that the master plan having some sort of design element will be the best way to clearly articulate community values with regard to design, which has been the work, has been a task that SPRAB has taken up and done pretty well. I, I had a conversation with, with the chair and remarked that the, I think that the PFARS building, uh, had a much better outcome from what was, now that wasn't a planning board application, it was a zoning board op application, um, but SPRAB and PEC um, really worked with the applicant 
to, um, you know, to push sustainable elements and were successful in having a more sustainable rescue squad building than, than previously. I think that there were, there was mention, I think Mr. Laplace mentioned the sort of conflicts with people who are uh, working professionally in the municipality and have, uh, and would then interface with municipal um, BCCs or employees. I personally don't think that that's a, a good idea. I think that that enters uh, a an ethical gray area. But that's those are those are questions. As I read this ordinance for this board to consider, um, these are questions that aren't going to be answered tonight. And I think that's a I think that's a good exercise for this board anticipating a robust design element in the master plan, which I don't think it, from from what I gather is uh, is putting squarely into 2023, I would guess the middle to the end of 2023 at this point. So thank you. Well, thanks, Tim. Um, Mr. McGowan? Um, I have several comments. Um, and if anything, I guess I'm a little more confused in some in some ways than than when I when when I first read this. Um, it has to do with the fact that it seems now that part of the purpose of what we're doing here is to design another process to replace. Spread, um, but we don't know. But and, and it's based on design, and that's also based on a certain amount of technical knowledge. Uh, I am, you know, if we're going to have a subcommittee of the um, of the planning board, I mean, I you know, I, I, I'm a lawyer by training, and and I you know, I do not have. And I could not be on this this committee because I don't I don't have that type of training. I can follow when when there are other people who do, and they explain this. I can follow it, but I could not be in a position of of making that that decision. Um. So I mean, it, it's it's lead it leads me to the fact that okay, if it's a subcommittee and if we need specialized. Um, people with certain spe specialized training, then wouldn't the subcommittee somewhere have to, if not hire, if, you know, get, get some type of professional training from someone that's not, you know, someone that's not on the board to assist in the design. So doesn't that essentially lead us back around again to essentially what, what we have now, which is, which is which is, you know, which is crap. Um, that, that's and part of my thoughts. Uh, Mr. McGowan, if, if yeah. you don't mind me interrupting, that was one question. So I thought maybe I'd jump in and Go ahead. explain this. The, the planning board is, is, is empowered and should have a committee that reviews applications and classifies them as to whether or not they are minor or major. It's written into the ordinance that that committee has specific requirements, specific responsibilities. That committee is supposed to look at Section 10B226 and review applications in conform to see if they're in, see what how they conform to 10B226. It is what I do as the land use engineer. It is my report that you see at the planning board that SPRAB sees as well. Upon reviewing every application, it is the responsibility of the committee to either deem it as a minor application or as a major application. And there are specific processes that are supposed to take place once an application is deemed minor or major. Those are not being followed. 
That's one of the problems with the way the process works. And that is what we are trying to get back to because MLUL is very specific about how applications are supposed to be processed. And SPRAB is a separate step in, in the process that what isn't envisioned in MLUL, um, in, per in particular in the way that the review is done now, which is more on looking at how a, a project is designed in terms of layout and, and architectural treatments and things like that. I'm not saying it's not valuable, but it, SPRAB doesn't do what it's supposed to do as a committee of the board. The committee of the board, and, and the ordinance is incorrect in, in actually identifying SPRAB as the committee that reviews all site plans. Uh, and, and that's been my opinion since the day I came to work here a year and a half ago. Um, and, and we at staff have been struggling with how to get to the point we are at today um, and, and move well, back well, to a process that's well, well, in conformance well, with MLU. Well. But I, I sort of see I, those as two separate separate issues. I mean, we can we can address the issue of major versus minor. Um, I think pretty straightforwardly, and Mr. Mueller may want to speak to this. I mean, I, either the planning board. It, I think it is. I think the MLUL assigns that to the planning board or a subcommittee thereof. So I think the planning board has been doing that. I don't. I don't. Uh, well, and but I'm not gonna. <laughs> Uh, I could very well be wrong about that, but I see that as a separate issue personally from from a design I was, review. And I I'm was very, just trying. Very, I was just uh, trying to answer. I was just trying to answer Mr. McGowan's question. Okay. Holy and, and, and to your to point, up, yeah, Alvin, we're not about trying to set up a new. We're not trying to set up a new process with this ordinance. We're trying to move to an, a process that is in conformance with MLUL and in conformance with our own ordinance, which is that. The planning board appoints a committee that reviews the applications in in compliance with 10B226. Yeah. But I, and, I and think- to your point, I'm sorry, David, just a sec. Mr. McGowan, to your point about, um, you know, a subcommittee of the board and not having the expertise and stuff, I, I, I'm totally with you on that. I, I think one of the things that we're going to need to noodle through and probably a, a sub an ad hoc subcommittee of the planning board could could sort of tackle some of these questions along with staff and Mr. Muller. Um, uh, under what circumstances, what does it take for us to potentially be able to establish a new committee advisory committee to the planning board that includes planning board members and other people who bring specific design um, chops. Uh, again, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's where my brain has been going. Madam Chair, I just wanted to add to Jim's answer to Mr. McGowan that I would point out that even our current planning board has a talented architect on it, has a historic preservation specialist on it, has people that have both planning and environmental backgrounds and a lot of other business and finance and other qualities in education and experience. So even right now, I think, you know, the, our planning board, you know, has some of that background that, that could contribute to a new design review process. And certainly the council can always, you know, I'd love to see another planner on the planning board, you know, like the council can do that. So, you know, this is, this is gonna be an interesting conversation, I think. Okay, this is, but, but I gotta tell you, when, when we start talking about design, those sorts of things, I, I'm, I'm listening uh, to Councilman Cohen, and um, he's making lots. He's making lots of sense about the fact that no, this is a little bit more than just just you know determining whether it's a minor or a uh, site plan or a major site site plan list. There's, I mean, there's a little bit more to it. I think if I'm hearing correctly. There have been some hints about community character that may get that may that also may get involved in these these things. Um, by the way, I haven't told you where I'm going. I haven't really told you where I'm going because I, I 
uh, of some some other proposals, but I, I'm I'm I want to make sure I got something straight here. I'm looking at this ordinance, and it's the it's the parts of the ordinance that are underlined that's that are going to be changed. The remaining parts of the ordinance um, are the same as as they as they always have been. Am I correct in that? Well, it, bracketed bracketed text is being well bracketed bracketed text removed being... and, and underlined. But aside from that, it's it's the same ordinance right. as as before. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But but Alvin, there are also whole sections of the ordinance that are just removed by reference. They're not appearing in what you're seeing. But I will say, like section, you know, two point three delete in its entirety without you seeing the language. So well, well, I, just I, I, I mean, I got, yeah, I got that. I got that. Um, then now again, this gets, this, this is gets, for me, it gets to be uh, technical. Review of applications by administrative officer. What's an administrative officer? Staff. What staff. part of the staff? What part, just it's staff. It's all, it's, it's staff, entirely right? staff. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, he, he, here's where I think I'm going with this. I won't. I won't delay this. It seems to me you're putting the cart before the horse. You should figure out. You've you've decided that we're going to get rid of something, and then we're going to adjust what we've got. What we've gotten rid of with with some other. Plan, plans and plan, you know, plans and, and other things. And that somehow we should do, instead of su you know, suggesting this, we get rid of scrap at this point, we have to know what it is we're going to replace or what it is we're going to replace it with. And so that's my feeling. Can I respond to that, Chair? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Laplace. Yeah, Mr. McGowan, I can see where it would appear to be that. But I, I want to stress the urgency of the need to for SPRAB to not be in place anymore. It is outside of the municipal land use law. We are operating, we already, if you, if this doesn't move forward, we're gonna have to continue to have SPRAB meetings and be operating outside of the municipal land use law. That is not protecting Princeton or the applicants before the boards or the community. So that's why this is before you this evening. And that's what concerns staff. Staff mm -hmm. wanted this done over a year ago and a year ago, you know, council decided to take some time and, and consider it. And here we are a year later. So there is, a, there is an urgency that we need to get our process. I think we need to have it in conformance with the municipal land use law, clear, streamlined, effective, and hopefully better. I mean, that's, that's what the opportunity is before us. And that is what staff is unanimously asking the planning board to endorse. I just want to add to that, that this board is not dismantling anything this but <laughs> this is a council uh ordinance uh, and council is asking what we think um council you know is within its power to dissolve the committee that it uh established or the, i guess the very the, the respective governing bodies established a long time ago um so i just want to um, I just wanted to make that um, simple point. Um, so, Alvin, did you have other anything else to add, or because uh, I've got other people with hands up, and I'm I not, know, I know, and I, may, and I may wait, short. I may wait, I may wait for if I have something else. I have a general question, but I won't worry about it at the moment. I, okay. well, I am going to come back to something then. All right, okay. so you can go ahead to Mr. O'Donnell and Mr. Cohen. Fair enough. Yeah, Mr. O'Donnell and then Mr. Cohen. Thank you. Um, I, I want to start off with something that Michael just said. Uh, this plan has supposedly been kicked around, thought about for more than a year. Uh, I just found out about this about two weeks ago. So why not come to the planning board somewhat earlier and say, this is an idea we have. This is why it will work. This is, you know, I mean, you, know, you don't have to respond to that if you don't want to, but it just kind of sticks in my craw a little bit that, you know, I feel like this has been 
dumped on us and we're, and we're being told we have to make a decision now. So that's first. Uh, secondly, I find the spread reports extremely helpful when, when reviewing uh, applications. And with all the changes that are going on uh, in Princeton and all the meetings that we've had, um, without the spread reports and also without, by taking away yet another voice of the public, I think we're doing ourselves a great disservice. Um, you know, SPREB is a group of uh, citizen experts in various fields who add to the conversation and they have open meetings that also engender comments from the public. Uh, and I think that taking that away from the, the citizens of Princeton uh, is not a good idea. Uh, I also think that it is not a good idea to dismantle, however, you know, to have the council strike SPRAB without having the appropriate replacement as Alvin said. Uh, and then finally, I, I believe that without the work that SPRAB does, we, will, we would have had more than 33 meetings last year. We may have been scheduling meetings practically every week. Um, so uh, I see Michael shaking his head no, and I will stop speaking at this point. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Yeah, I, I, I have two questions actually. One is for Jerry and one's for Michael. Um, for The question for Jerry is, as a planning board, if we create a subcommittee of the planning board, that's the successor design review body, can we go outside of the planning board membership to uh, supplement the design expertise uh, that we uh, do or do not have? Thank you, Michael, for saying I'm a talented architect, but there are a lot of more talented architects than me. I, I, I would not personally feel um, comfortable being responsible as the sole architectural voice doing design review on projects. Um, I, I would want to be in a dialogue with, with equally or more qualified um, um, uh, colleagues. And the question for you, Michael, is my understanding is there are only two aspects of what SPRAB does that are in contradiction to the MLUL. And one is this determination of major versus minor site plan. And the other is uh, signage design review that there, we have in the former township, certain signs that SPRAB is authorized to um, approve or disapprove without planning board action. Are there any other aspects of what SPRAB does that are contrary to the MLUL, or is it just those two aspects? Because I have to say in the year that I've been on SPRAB, we've done neither of those things. We haven't had a single application on which we've had to decide whether it was major or minor, and we haven't had a single sign application. Um, so these are, these are actually rare uh, duties um, before, the plan, before SPRAB, and, and you know, the planning board is aware uh, from SPRAB reports of what the sort of regular order of, order of business is at SPRAB, which, which I think is really consistent with what the MLUL envisions when it um, empowers municipalities to create a site plan review advisory board. Do you want Jerry's answer first or mine? Uh, Jerry's first and then yours. That's a very good question. Um, I had just written a note to myself about five minutes ago as to whether a planning board can have a subcommittee which has non-planning board members. I am not certain that they, they, that they can. Traditionally, they do not, but that's something that could be looked into. There might not be any case law on this as well. The only provision in the municipal land use law that, which really deals with citizens' uh, participation is a provision that says the mayor can appoint a citizens' advisory committee, and that really is SPRAB. Um, and that's about it, but that's something that has to be looked in, uh, looked at further. 
Um, and as I say, I'm not I'm not certain that that as a committee of the board whether whether that would be proper. It might be, but I'm I'm I question that. Okay. Yeah, and David, I would I would respond to you that off the top of my head, I can't think of other specific areas, but overall, you know, the municipal land use law gives options to the planning board for how to carry out site plan review. It doesn't mention anything that is like our spread. And I'm a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey. I am required and ethically guided by the municipal land use law. I have to uphold it. So I'm telling you my personal feeling, and I think my other land use team members here in town hall would agree, we feel very uncomfortable continuing with SPRAB when it's working outside of the municipal land use law. That is something as a professional licensed planner in the state of New Jersey, I am not supposed to do. So I am very uncomfortable in a professional capacity. Having said that, I don't think SPRAB is the only way to do good design review in, in this town. I mean, it's not either SPRAB or nothing. I don't understand why the conversation seems to be going that way a little bit tonight. It, we're not saying that. We're saying, how can we make the design review process even because better and in conformance with law? Because, and, because and some municipalities, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Be, be, what's going on, Michael? Because you're saying, well, there could be some other process. It doesn't have to be SPRAB. Well, what is it? Alvin, let me answer. If you all want SPRAP to continue even temporarily now, you are asking professional staff to carry out an operation, a procedure, and to spend time and resources that are not, that don't fall under the, 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 the direction of the municipal land use law. I'm just telling you that's a very uncomfortable situation for me as a professional planner to be in. I'm just being honest with you. Yeah, let, let me jump in. Also, first, first Evan, uh, just response to one of your questions. Um, and, and Michael has more of a handle on this than I do, but some towns have basically created architectural review boards. Um, and that they, they've been upheld by, by the courts as long as there are sufficient standards. Um, so that, that's one option that, that, that should be, certainly should be explored. Um, David, I think the, the concern that his staff has expressed to me, and this is very, very recent, is that over the past whatever time period, there haven't been any cases where something could be classified as a minor, which didn't involve variances. They all involve variances, and that kind of took that out of the, the classification function out of the jurisdiction of under the ordinance of the um, of SPRAB and put it with, with the planning board. I am told there are a couple of applications that are coming up that have no um, variances and therefore the, uh, the board, the SPRAB uh, under the ordinance would have to make a classification decision. Frankly, I would, I would give the advice to, the, uh, to the, the planning board and staff that they should not do that, that they should not um, uh, have SPRAB do that, that it should be done by the planning board because the municipal land use law supersedes the, um, uh, the ordinance. Yeah, and I'm I'm totally fine with that. I mean, you know, I, I hope I've been clear that I am entirely supportive of rectifying the legal um, weaknesses of our ordinance. Yeah. It's just not clear to me that eliminating SPRAB is necessary in order to, you know, there there are pieces of this ordinance that could be passed. Uh, you know, on, on Monday night, that would take those powers away from SPRAB. If we could amend the ordinance and leave SPRAB in existence, but just take their take those powers away from SPRAB. Um, I think that's a substantive change, so it'd have to be reintroduced. We couldn't do it on Monday night, but it could be done very quickly and simply without abolishing SPRAB. I need to jump in one more time. I'm not sure I'm being clear, but part of what SPRAB does, which is so valuable to the planning board, is not codified anywhere. Their design review, the things that they comment on, are not in MLUL and not in our ordinance. There are no standards by which they're making design review comments. 
That is one of the things that I am the most com just uncomfortable with. I, when, I do. I, can I but, just respond? I mean, because perfect. we've been talking on HPC for the last four years while I've been the liaison about the fact that we don't have any design standards for HPC either and that we need them. And right. we really like them, but nobody is suggesting that HPC be disbanded because they don't have design standards in place. I mean, it is possible to do design review as long as it's not binding, right? This, you know, I know Trishka has concern that if SPRAB was a, was a final arbiter as opposed to an advisory board, that they would need these um clear standards but because it's just advisory i don't think that the the need for the clear standards is i i, I haven't heard any justification why that should be more true for SPRAP than it is for hpc well maybe maybe julie can comment on hpc but it's my understanding and i know working with elizabeth our David. Historic, historic preservation officer is that HPC does use the Secretary of Interior standards, which are our national standards, National Park Service standards for historic preservation. So in fact, there are design guidelines that are consistently referenced by HPC. Well, there's also, there's also a set of actual architectural standards in very, very abstract uh, in the historic preservation ordinance. Uh, Julie's had her hand up for a while. Can, I'm can sorry, I just very yeah. quickly, yeah. Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Cohen, you referenced uh, someone by first name who might not be familiar. The rest of the board might not be familiar with her. If you could explain who Trishka is and, and what she does. And the yeah. other qualifying thing that I would add to what Mr. LaPlace said is that our own Julie Capizzoli is in fact a licensed architect in the state of New Jersey in addition to being a his, uh, an expert in historic uh, preservation. So, Thanks, <laughs> Trishka. Julie, I'm who, sorry I didn't mention that. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you explain who Trishka is since- No, I think it it's better for the sitting councilman too. She's our municipal council. She does what Jerry does, but for the council instead of for the planning board. So uh, Julie Capazzoli and then yeah. Zenon Texarni. Well, I just wanted to go to the um, process <clears throat> that HPC uses. Um, and <clears throat> concept review is a major part of our um, monthly meetings. So, you know, we always have applications, but we are eager and really happy when um, people who are thinking about submitting an application come for a concept review. And that means that our preservation officer does not create a report. So there are no staff reports involved in a concept review. The other thing is that um, in a concept review, a lot of things are worked out, some basic things. And, and I'm understanding that um, Part of the issue here is that, you know, the timing of when SPRAB looks at an application is usually so far along that it becomes very difficult for the applicant to, to maneuver. And I don't know if there's some way that this concept review can happen, not only with staff, but with some kind of an appointed body but that that the timing of it seems to be really critical point uh very well taken um it yeah. so are, is that a question that you want someone to address or is that a it's just this statement on how hbc has been dealing with a lot of these applications that mo many of our applications were first coming through as concept reviews. Yeah. Yeah, Zanon? yeah I mean, yeah, I, I, I echo that. I, I think that, um, you know, that's been uh, a constant frustration of the Environmental Commission um, is that, you know, the 
these type plans that we see are always very late in the game. You know, the, the, the designs have been full, kind of fully fleshed out and, you know, the applicants are usually not willing to budge too much. And that's definitely been the case at the planning board. You know, at this, at, at, by the time it gets to the planning board, there's really not much that can be done. And so I think that um, however we can, you know, potentially restructure it to, to deal with that. I mean, you know, I, I'm kind of agnostic about, you know, whether or not we should, you know, disband SPRAB. I mean, I, I, I echo David's comments about the value of SPRAB. And I, I don't think that the planning board has the expertise to be able to do the functions of SPRAB in-house plus the time, you know, they dedicate a lot of time and, um, you know, to, to add that to our existing time commitments is just, I think would be too much. Um, so I think, you know, it, yeah, I, I, th I see the value of keeping SPRAB. I understand that there's frustration within the staff uh, and, and also potentially concerns about how it's not uh, conforming with the municipal land use law. But actually I, 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 I did take a look at the municipal land use law and it does have, um, you know, a statute about um, citizen advisory committees. And so it does say after the appointment of the planning board, the mayor may appoint one or more persons as a citizen's advisory committee to assist or collaborate with the planning board in its duties, but such person or persons shall have no, no power to vote or take other action required of the board. Such person or persons shall serve at the pleasure of the mayor. So I think that that is, in, in my sense, you know, my reading, you know, sort of um, grounds to create um, something like SPRAB. I don't know, um, you know, what, what kind of powers SPRAB has that, you know, maybe this, this is saying. Um, that, is, that is the provision. Yeah. It authorizes the creation of SPRAB. That's what I was referring right. to before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, the question I mean, is whether or not there a, a committee appointed by the planning board um, could have outside members. Mm -hmm. That's really the, the question, whether be, since this ordinance um, anticipates the planning board may um, appoint a committee to take up a, a, a chunk of what SPRAB does and make sure that it's consistent with the ML municipal land use law and et cetera, et cetera, you know, can, can we do that um, and not rely only on planning board members to populate that committee? That's a, the question we don't have an answer to right this minute. Right. Yeah, yeah. Chair, I just wanted to respond quickly to, to Zenon's comment about it's often too late in the process to change anything and the planning board can't do much about it, a design. Just tonight, we, re, we approved a resolution of findings of fact for 91 Prospect Avenue. And that is a dramatic example of that this planning board and the leadership of staff, you know, working with the university, the applicant, made a considerable change to that proposal. And so I think I just wanted to address that. I mean, there seems to be not a lot of credit that the, some of the members of the planning board are given to the technical expertise and the creativity and that just sheer effort of, of their in-house staff. We've worked very hard and we continue to from the very beginning. And you've I, got that already in place. I just hope that's being seriously considered. No, for sure. I, 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 I totally respect, uh, you know, all the talent and, and um, work, hard work that the staff does um, commit. Um, I just think that you know, it's just, I'm just stating a point that, you know, we um, in, at PEC are certainly frustrated because the applicants don't really come to us earlier and, you know, don't really want to change much once they come to us. And then, you know, certainly at, at the planning board, I mean, yeah, there are exceptions, you know, where, you know, we've been able to change things. And, you know, I've, I feel like I have some, some accomplishments, accomplishments under my belt, but, you know, I, I think that, they're, they're kind of nitpicking, you know, they're kind of like tweaking things at the very end. Whereas, you know, sometimes projects, you know, need to be completely different from the get-go. So I don't know, um, but yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever kind of, you know, changes um, are made, I think that that's something that certainly should be addressed. Yeah, I mean, one approach consistent with um, the way staff is handling these early on is to bring in, if it seemed desirable, 
uh, additional consultants that could be paid out of escrow. And that could include an architect, for example, um, we, which would you know bulk up that, that technical expertise on the, on the staff side. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, that's, that's an option, although that kind of adds a little bit more burden to the applicants. I mean, I think that, you know, you have citizens that are willing and talented professionals that are willing to, to kind of provide their time and input and, uh, and, you know, at, at no real cost. <laughs> I mean, I guess there is some cost that, you know, administratively, but I mean, I, I think that, you know, for the value that they bring, it's, you know, it's certainly worth it. In my opinion. It's an interesting point that, you know, if they didn't have the extra meeting, if the applicants didn't have the extra meeting in front of SPRAB, they'd probably be happy to pay an architect to do that. <laughs> yeah, that Maybe. I don't know what the economics of that is. I, I think it's probably true. Certainly, um, I, I know in West Windsor, we just abolished SPRAB about a year and a half or two years ago and created a technical review committee, which is just staff. Um, yeah. But what would the, the, the the genesis of that was that uh, so many developers were complaining that it was redundant, which is a term Michael used earlier, and that they were, it was a tremendous expenditure of going before SPRAB and then basically repeating um, the process before the planning board. So that at least there are some developers and probably a lot who look at it um, that way and consistent with what uh, David just said a minute ago. Yeah, and I, and I just wanted to add sort of a continuation of my example of 91 Prospect Avenue in the university uh, application. You know, no process is perfect. And if you think about, for instance, SPRAB's review of 91 Prospect Avenue, SPRAB's findings had no say about the court club being moved and the three buildings being knocked down across the street. Um, luckily, when it went to HPC, HPC really flagged that for the planning board, you know, and staffed it as well. And as you recall, that was, a, that was a matter of huge importance to this community. Thousands of people, you know, signed petitions and spoke up and came to our planning board meetings. And, you know, that's, that's quite frankly, that was, SPRAB just didn't go in the same direction. So, you know, I think, I think Michael, SPRAB is little, not, a little David, can I finish my David, can I finish my comment, please? I have total respect for all the good work that SPRAB's done. But, you know, I think that's an example of, when it didn't work out well. So no system's perfect, but we should always be looking at improving, I think, our system. Go ahead, Dave. And the reason I think it's unfair is that SPRAB regularly gets slapped down for getting out of their lane. And for them to weigh in on historic preservation issues when they knew that HPC was gonna see this same application, I think it was perfectly reasonable for them not to weigh in on that. Well, the staff comments to SPRAB in the report to SPRAB that I wrote and that other people wrote flagged this as an important issue and it was ignored. So I'm just pointing out, I think it's fair for the planning board to consider the full range and, and effectiveness of SPRAB if we're talking about SPRAB. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and it it is important to um, weigh very heavily what we're hearing so unequivocally from staff people that we have a lot of respect for. <laughs> so um, if, um, if there are no more comments from board members, there are uh, five folks who have raised their hands um, to speak. And, you know, partly because this, um, first of all, I think we, we're, we're going to, at our retreat, address the issue of a completely consistent, oh, suddenly there's eight <laughs> uh, consistent, um, policy about um, public comment on ordinances, but because this does have implications um, for what the planning board uh, may do and have on its plate, um, if council uh, adopts this ordinance, um, I think it is important to, um, to hear from the public. So I see that um, uh, Carrie has brought over Mr. Wolf already. Um, up next after Mr. Wolf will be Louisa Clayton and then Bruce Lawton. Um, I would ask, implore uh, members of the public to uh, keep your comments to three minutes or less. Um, we'll be timing you and I invite you to time yourself. <laughs> Set your own you know, iPhone or whatever 
uh, so that nobody has to uh, interrupt you. And if anybody does, it'll probably be Mr. Lesko with his best um, FM PBS voice, uh, respectful and, uh, um, but we, we need to make sure everybody has a chance. So yeah. um, Mr. Wolf. Oh, just, Mr. To be, just to be clear, Louise, that we've we've asked Mr. Lesko to uh, to speak up um, when uh, when someone who's making a comment hits the two minute and thirty second mark. Good, yeah. In a non jarring way, hopefully. <laughs> yes. Good. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wolf, you're on mute. Um, and because this is not a hearing, I'm assuming, Mr. Muller, that you will not be swearing in folks. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay, but we still want you to identify yourself, uh, first, name, uh, first name, last name, and spell your last name. Go right ahead, Bill. I'm William Wolf, W-O-L-F-E. Uh, I served on SPRAB for more than 20 years, uh, most of those as chairman. And I'm very glad to see that Louisa Clayton, who is the current uh, chair of SPRAB, will, will follow me. And I'm glad to see SPRAB in those good, capable hands. <clears throat> Since members of the planning board are prohibited by the state ethics law from filing for permits or site plan approvals in Princeton, uh, they are eliminated uh, from serving uh, the function of SPRAB and the elimination of SPRAB would eliminate review by those most qualified to contribute to the process. You have a notable exception in David Cohen who has been willing to abandon a local practice of architecture in order to serve in the government. My hat's off to him, but his case is an exception. Many other architects have chosen to decline or resign from deciding boards, such as the council or the planning board. And it's unreasonable to expect professionals to abandon their livelihood. Uh, Prab works largely because it is not a deciding board, but an advisory board. And therefore its members do not have that ethical problem. <clears throat> the site plan review board was created by the municipal land use law. Uh, and it's stated at its creation Insofar as practicable, appointees shall be architects, landscape architects, planners, engineers, or other persons qualified in site planning or environmental design or protection. I believe this language is still on the books and it is important. Administrative staff has always uh, and can only be expected to call attention to site plan elements which seconds. violate municipal or state regulations and land use laws. Incidentally, in the 20 years um, that uh, I was chairman, SPRAB never made the determination as to whether a site plan was a minor or a major. That was always a staff function. It still is the responsibility of the planning board, but the planning board has always delegated that to staff. I don't see a problem with that. But what staff can be expected to do is to enforce the minimum standards allowed by law. To expect more of them would undoubtedly add both to the cost, the time, and the liability to the municipality. As licensed professionals, SPRAB members have used their training and skills not only to fully visualize what is being proposed, but they have also been able to visualize significant alternatives to what is being proposed. From this competence, 
Sprab has been able to make important creative suggestions for improvements to applications. I'd like to Mr. say Wolf, that I you're, fully you're support okay. an earlier review by Sprab and have been adv advocated that for years. Over time, Sprab has developed the, uh, uh, their capacity into a means that allows the planning board to consider an improved version of site plans submitted. Not only can SPRAB suggest improvements to the submitted plan, SPRAB has often invited the applicant to show an improved version to the planning board. This allows the planning board to consider alternatives with clarity and confidence, rather than have to simply choose to approve or deny an application as it has been submitted. Without that SPRAB review, you would, have, you would only have the initial submitted documents to consider. Mr. Wolf, I, I need to ask you to please um, finish up. You're at five minutes and I- I will. It, it's just not fair. So please- this, this process relies on a dialogue between professionals who have common goals and understand reasonable feasibilities. Without this input, the planning board will have very little positive impact on future development in Princeton. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie, can you bring over Ms. Clayton? My name is Louisa, go right ahead. Thanks, thank you, Chair. My name is Louisa Clayton, C-L-A-Y-T-O-N, and I'm the Chair of the Site Plan Review Advisory Board. I've been a member of SPRAB since 2017 and Chair for the last year. Before that, I served for many years as a member of the Zoning Board of Adjustment. SPRAB was shocked to hear of this ordinance only 24 hours before it was introduced, since we believe that we provide a valuable service to the Planning Board and to the community. SPRAB provides critical cross-disciplinary and collaborative input on development applications that is more nuanced and creative than the evaluation from staff on compliance to the municipal code. The planning, zoning, and engineering staff evaluate development applications in the context of the municipal ordinances and master plan. SPRAB complements these reports by evaluating the applications in a broader context, combining the information of the staff reports with the reports of the other boards and commissions to provide a comprehensive review. We make clear and concise recommendations for improvement of the applications based upon our experiences of living in this town, as well as our own specialties in planning, design, environment, stormwater, and development. SPRAB members spend more than 50 unpaid hours per person per year reviewing applications, visiting sites, holding meetings, and preparing detailed reports for the planning board. Our dedication to this board is indicative of its significance to the Princeton community, and it would be difficult for staff or members of the planning board to add this kind of time to their already busy schedules. We consistently serve as a dress rehearsal for the applicants to present their projects, give them appropriate and thoughtful feedback, and allow them time to revise and add to their documents before the planning board hearing. This gives the planning board the luxury of being able to vote at their hearing instead of sending the applicants back to improve their applications. Or as in a recent application from the university, developers could anticipate our questions and suggestions and incorporate them into their designs from the beginning. Applicants consistently thank us for our considered review of their applications and make real changes to their projects based upon our recommendations. For example, following our review of the Avalon Bay project at the shopping center, Michael Laplace included the SPRAB recommendation to save a covered walkway at the south end of the courtyard that was slated to be demolished. Based on feedback from SPRAB, the vehicular traffic patterns were changed to remove truck traffic from the southern portion of the site, therefore making the area safer for pedestrians, bikers, and children going to and from the ball fields and playground at Grover Park. These are meaningful ideas that would not be recommended by staff as they are more subtle than the broad strokes of the municipal requirements. 30 seconds. Development explodes in Princeton with the new overlays for affordable housing and redevelopment. We need more eyes on these projects, not fewer. Development projects are complicated and include a lot of information. They impact not only their own sites, but entire neighborhoods. Careful and considered review is important. Once these projects are built, it is very hard and expensive to remove them. 
once these projects exist, they become precedent for future development. It is worth taking the time and using local volunteer experts who know and love this town to make sure that every project is not only compliant with our regulations, but also well planned for the benefit of our town and for our community. And in any remaining seconds I have, I will say that we have been asking for years to see these projects earlier in the process, because it's true, often we see them when a lot of money has already been spent. And to Julie's point, the HPC encourages concept review. And I really wish that SPRAB could do concept review um, as well, because I think we would be much more effective and, and get to these projects a lot earlier. Okay. But I say that SPRAB, really does a lot of the hard lifting in the report writing. And I'm not discounting the efforts of staff and the time that they spent spend on the staff meetings, but I will say that for as long as I've been on SPRAB, uh, we have done the heavy lifting on the report writing. So um, I just hope that, um, that you know, you, you, you take these comments to heart and you take our reports and our, and our design comments to heart. Also, Design is not just architectural aesthetics. It's about the traffic patterns. It's about you know, the way people move through a site. It's about the way the buildings are built to be environmentally sensitive and to shade the sun in the summer. And, and it incorporates the environmental um, aspects as well, impervious coverage, trees, everything. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're, those are, that's everything that we are looking at when we look at, at projects. Um, and so it's, it, it would be a real loss for the town to lose this kind of review and to really, and, and also to limit it to just an architectural review board. Okay. Thank you. We are, we hear you. Thank you. Um, uh, the next person is Mr. Bruce Lawton and then Dana Bruce Molina. Lawton and then Dana Molina. And, and I would again ask that you please, please observe a three minute time frame. Mr. Lawton, are you with us? If so, you're muted and your camera is not going. Ah, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Can you activate your camera, please, sir? Sure, certainly. <clears throat> Uh, I've chosen my camera. I not had this problem here before. There we go. <clears throat> this is Bruce Lawton. I'm at Hawthorne Avenue. Uh, the right ahead. The, thank you. The proposed abolishing of Princeton's site plan review advisory board would appear to be the latest in a troubling pattern that marches in the direction of removing any oversight, alternate or opposing view to established interest. In this case, those of developers, businesses and the university, and those often aligned with them. In a time where more and more we see that alternate or opposing input and concerns are either brushed off, scoffed at, or fall on deaf ears, it would be refreshing to see support rather than abandonment of a group that provides another point of view to the powers that are in charge of balancing and making decisions about how the physicality of Princeton as a town and home to a diverse population of residents homeowners and taxpayers will either be preserved or be changed going into its future. Sometimes a perceived nuisance is necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawton. Okay, Dana Molina and then uh, Mr. Zinder. Okay, would you uh, bring him over at the same time just so we can go seamlessly from Ms. Molina to Mr. Zinder. Welcome, Ms. Molina. Thank you. This is Dana Molina, uh, M-O-L-I-N-A, and I served on SPRAB as a member of the Princeton Environmental Commission. Um, and I just want to speak to, I think, the importance of having a committee of this type. So I appreciate very much staff's comments that they want to make sure that it meets any legal requirements. I do not understand However, the recommendation of disbanding a committee without any plans specific to how to for, um, still serve those needs that are met by that committee 
um, in its uh, current form. Um, I think that you could adjust and I would make the recommendation the planning board uh, supports the continuation of SPRAB with any adjustments needed to make sure that it's meeting any legal requirements. I also would recommend also that uh, we support SPRAB seeing uh, proposals sooner. Uh, it was very clear that when I served, uh, the proposals that came almost for review were always so much more successful when they came to the planning board. And I also know how much the planning board has valued the proposal uh, write-ups that SPRAB does and how much um, they serve. I also think that it is very limited to not um, embrace and encourage the volunteer efforts served by the SPRAB committee and their expertise. You have incredible talent and skill donating their time to help our community. And I think we should be figuring out how to make sure that staff and SPRAB are working as well as they can together. But I have seen huge errors, I believe, in the planning design of this town when we aren't honoring more citizen engagement and just relying on our staff leadership as good as they are. It's just you need more eyes. And we have so many huge projects coming before our town soon, especially with affordable housing, with things going on with our school district as well. You need more eyes and you need more skilled eyes. And I think the planning board is very served by having SPRAB's advice, expertise, and guidance. And we would be very short-sighted to disband them simply because of a few specific things that we've identified don't meet ordinance. And I think that those should be addressed, but not disband the committee. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zinder? And then uh, Carrie, um, excuse me, Josh. Carrie, can you bring over uh, Ms. Shosh? And, and then after that, uh, Ms. Cherry? Go ahead, Josh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, I live on Moore Street. I run an architecture firm in town. Um, I'm the immediate past president of the AI in New Jersey. Um, and I'm a former member of SPRAB. I sat on this committee for, I believe, five years. Um, SPRAB is intended to be an advisory committee of professionals. Um, certainly that's what it was when I was on it. I was told numerous times that I could not present to any board in town or submit projects for permit while I served. Um, and this was reinforced a number of times with legal interpretations and reviews. Um, planning board members are not permitted in New Jersey to be design professionals, architects, engineers, and planners or similar that do work in their particular municipality. And it was created, SPRAB was created to avoid this conflict. But the, and there was a time when there were more architects per square foot in Princeton than any other community in the United States. You know, and, and there were many architects that did not practice in town. And it was relatively easy to fill this committee with people who could be truly independent, but that's no longer the case. Um, a design subcommittee of the planning board does not work as well as design professionals are <clears throat> um, you know, does not work as design professionals um, as planning board typically members don't have that experience. Um, there have been instances though, where members of SPRAB have actually competed for projects that we have presented to SPRAB, which creates a conflict of interest. And at the same time, then having SPRAB members present to planning or zoning when on another day they are reading their reports um, which are, are advocating for issues. And that's really problematic. Having a subcommittee of the planning board I see is also problematic as we need design professional input on some of these projects. But SPRAB tends to go too far. There are many SPRAB meetings where members would break out tracing paper and redesign project elements, significant elements. You know, these occurrences were far outside the purview of, of SPRAB. And in general, I think is one of the reasons why um, there's so much um, bitterness about this particular committee. Um, and at the same time, they do have the ability to approve minor plans. And I was a part of a number of these minor approvals um, that then bypassed the planning board, which is clearly outside of, of the appropriate laws. It is unusual and more cumbersome than is needed, more, a more efficient process would certainly be welcome 
It does not do what it is supposed to do. We need to be more compliant. There are many other options. An advisory board is useful for the planning board, but SPRAD is not that committee. Um, an architectural review board in other municipalities are typically only advisory. They do not approve projects or work in their community or complete, compete for projects in their communities. Uh, concept reviews are not the answer. It makes for a bifurcated and much more burdensome process and more costly for, for our clients and people developing projects um, and harder for projects to move forward. And I know that SPRAB does do and did do concept reviews. I certainly sat on at least three projects I recall that SPRAB did concept reviews and those projects took years and years to get through the approval process as a result. Um, now, HPC, you could say it has all sorts of issues, but it does actually have standards, okay? What it needs are guidelines for the different districts, which is a completely different thing. The level of completion of documentation is actually a product of the requirements that we have in town for completeness review. That's my understanding is required by law. Um, and there are typically early conversations, very early conversations with staff that help guide the process. So okay. in conclusion, I would suggest that eliminating it is the correct move and reform and advise, reform and create an advisory committee entity that works within the law helps guide the process within clear guidelines and give it rules that work within the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zender. Uh, Ms. Shosh. My name is Ann Shosh, um, spelled S-O-O-S. -O -O I'm one of the Environmental Commission's liaisons to the Site Plan Review Advisory Board. I was very surprised to hear that council felt that removing SPRAB was in the town's best interest, since that board has been in existence since the late 60s, as I understand it. I was surprised to hear the ordinance state that our functions are, quote, duplicated by planning and engineering staff and result in redundant and potentially contradictory findings. I was also surprised that the council felt its best move was to complete the ordinance and introduce it without notifying or speaking in any way with the chair of SPRAB or indeed anyone on that board. Working transparently and cooperatively with stakeholders should be the way council proceeds. And I feel in this case, they fell short. Over the years, SPRAB has been a valuable preliminary step on the way to the planning board. SPRAB has been a place where discussions between developers and the board have been spirited, occasionally confrontational, more often collaborative, and always with the intent of helping to make the site plans as well-crafted as possible before the project moved on to the planning board with the interests of the town of Princeton always uppermost. Abolishing SPRAB may well eliminate, quote, an additional step in the development application process that adds time and expense to the applicant. However, streaming the process of development approval cited as a reason for the ordinance, while certainly a benefit to the developers, may not, in my opinion, be a benefit to this community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've already moved uh, Kip Cherry over and we have one more individual, Dunbar Bernie. Okay, thank you. Hi, Ms. Cherry. Hey, thank you very much. Um, as you know, I've been, uh, was born and raised in Princeton. I've been a licensed professional planner and a certified member of the American Institute of Certified Planners since the 1980s. With all respect, I must disagree with staff on this particular issue. And I don't fully understand why the classification problem or other technical problems can't be solved versus what SPRAB brings to the table. SPRAB is a unique organization that has uh, been contributing to the development and character of the town for many years. And I might say uh, it also has had an influence over the preservation of the town. It's a voluntary group of residents with a variety of expertises, including architectural, who know the town and its operation and its townscape. In a lot of ways, it is the eyes of the citizenry that takes time 
to make observations and share these observations in a discussion that is open to the public where the public can sit in and, and listen to the discussion. From these observations, SPRAB develops recommendations regarding aspects of each project that are important to the citizenry and the planning board members as they try to understand what a project is all about and gives an important perspective and recommendations to the planning board. SPRAB doesn't have meetings with the applicants. They are essentially closed to the general public. That is left to paid staff. SPRAB meetings are different. They are open to the public and they don't involve interaction uh, with the applicants. I don't think SPRAB is redundant in any way. I don't think that the issue with the MLUL is significant or can't be worked around. That is not to say that SPRAB is perfect, but SPRAB brings to the community a different homegrown perspective that is very different than what paid staff brings. And that's nothing against the paid staff, it's just that they're a different animal. I think it's very important to maintain SPRAB and it is needed more than ever as the borough and the township continue to, uh, to grow and prosper and, and develop um, each, uh, uh, as each project moves forward. Um, at the same time, uh, the master plan is in the works and that will take time uh, for the, uh, the staff. And um, I think that SPRAB is more important than ever uh, during that process. So um, I hope that uh, SPRAB is retained and I, I uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Bernie, welcome. Hi, um, it's nice to be here and uh, have a chance to say uh, my thoughts. Um, I, just as a matter of background, I teach at Rutgers. I work on solar power, uh, renewable energy kinds of technologies. And, you know, I know that comes to play in, in kinds of uh, green energy designs um, that might happen here. Um, but I am not part of SPRAB uh, or, or other um, uh, elements at this point. But, but I do see the value of having SPRAB as an element that, that receives community input and can look at things in a much deeper level than maybe staff can on their own, the, the planning board. And so, so I, I feel like having a community process is important. And, um, and, you know, obviously in the discussion that I've heard up till now, there may be some hiccups in that, maybe it could happen earlier or whatever, but, but we shouldn't just pitch it over the side because there might be some ways of improving it. Uh, let's, let's, you know, from what I hear, you're, you're, you're proposing to demolish something that is providing value right now. And so my advice would be, okay, come up with a replacement plan that also provides value in the similar ways. And so, so I don't, I don't um, support the present motion. And so I stand um, with um, other voices who have said, Let's keep this going until there's a better, better uh, um, plan to 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 trade over into. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just want to to repeat again that the um, that this board is uh, is not charged with dissolving. SPRAB. This board is discussing the implications for the planning board, uh, obviously, and um, uh, but this is a council ordinance uh, re referred to the planning board um, for our uh, comments and consideration, and then it goes back to council and council votes whether to adopt the ordinance that dis uh, disbands SPRAB or not. So, uh, but thank you to everybody who um, spoke. And um, I see one other hand was raised. Um, Mishosh has already spoken. So let's um, bring over Maria, uh, sorry, Marina Rubina. Um, anybody else who wishes to speak tonight should raise your hand now. Um, we're at 1048, um, the three minute 
guideline is very important to observe. Um, so I see that Marina is over. So um, Ms. Rubina, if you would unmute yourself and there's your camera, good. Welcome, go right ahead. Um, thank you, good evening. And um, I will keep my comments very brief. And I think um, surprisingly um, to my colleagues, probably on SPRAB, I am a member of SPRAB. Um, I would like to speak in support of disbanding SPRAB at the way that it stands right now, because I think the way it's structured right now, in a way it's very disrespectful to the volunteer time of the members of the board. We as design professionals put our hearts and our efforts into review applications and that uh, does not get anywhere because it's too late in the process. And it is very disrespectful to spend um, people's time in this way on the municipality's behalf. Um, so I think having people volunteer and Louise is absolutely correct with the amount of time that she estimated that people put into this process into setting wow. up in a way that it has not the full impact that it could have had. So I really truly hope that um, it could be rethought and restructured in a way that brings the benefits to the town, but also respects the volunteers time. And you guys as volunteers on this board, I'm sure can appreciate. Um, and we've had many talented professionals basically quit SPRAB and not wanted to participate because they felt they were not being heard and there was no way for them to make a positive impact. And when I was asked to join SPRAB, I asked Bill, do you think I can have an impact in a positive way? And he said, I'm not sure. And I think that that's basically the situation. So thank you. I hope I didn't waste too much time. Not at all. Thank you, Ms. Rubina. One minute, 42 seconds. <laughs> okay, so Lauren's counting. Uh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Lauren Seam, I'm moving mm -hmm. her over. Okay, thank you. Ms. Seam, if you would uh, unmute yourself and activate your camera, please. Welcome. Hi there. Um, I don't know how many of you um, attended the uh, zoning board meeting yesterday that was a parallel discussion to this one, but it went on for about, I don't know, over an hour. And the interesting thing was, and anyone who's on the zoning board, feel free to correct me, but what the zoning board members said over and over again was that they did not understand this ordinance, that they felt as Mr. O'Donnell um, on the planning board said, that they didn't feel they had time to understand this ordinance. Um, another point they made was that they understood that the planning board could form a subcommittee. They weren't sure if they could also form a subcommittee. And if they could form a subcommittee, they had the same question that Mr. Cohn and Mr. McGowan had, that they didn't feel that they had the expertise within the zoning board to, um, to form a subcommittee that could replace SPRAB. Now the zoning board seems to understand that the planning board uses SPRAB much more than the zoning board does. From what I gathered from the meeting yesterday, SPRAB uses the zoning, the zoning board uses SPRAB probably only about twice a year, but that they do find that these reports are incredibly helpful. And the most recent example they gave was the hotel. So this evening I have two questions. The first is a more general question. How do we have an ordinance in front of us that the zoning board clearly and has said repeatedly last night they don't understand. And from what I can understand, the planning board doesn't understand as well. And my second question is, could somebody clear up for me how getting rid of SPRAB, and I'm okay with, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic about whether we keep it or not, but how I understand how it could streamline things for developers. As a taxpayer and resident, I'd like to understand how this could benefit us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, your, your first question, I, I, I sort of take to be rhetorical. I say that with no disrespect. 
um, it, it because the ordinance seemed pretty straightforward to me, but I um, but I can understand how folks might not understand where it's coming from. Um, that that to me is sort of a, a different question, and I think that the staff have tried to explain that um, uh, as best they can uh, and and pretty succinctly. But as to the the value to um, uh, the community and taxpayers, I will let others speak to that. Perhaps board member, I mean uh, council members, perhaps staff. I. I would just quickly say that, and then to repeat of something I said at the top of this discussion, that SPRAB does involve a tremendous amount of staff time to actually service SPRAB, write reports, attend meetings, do the minutes. In a way, it takes almost as much time as managing the planning board. And we do have limited resources, and we have big challenges ahead of us, particularly the upcoming master plan. So I just want to, I would remind everyone of that. And, and Chair, I, I, I would think it benefits the public. It's it's one less meeting an applicant is going to have to go to. I mean, there's got to be some expense to to an applicant, you know, having to go in front of a in, in front of in front of this board. So that would be the other reason to to say that there's a benefit for mm. you know the just the general public. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so that is, I'm not seeing any more members of the public um, who have not yet spoken raising their hands. So with that, I will close the public um, portion of the meeting and it's um, um, five minutes to 11. I did not announce at the beginning of the meeting that we had a hard stop at 11, but I would, I would like to um, conclude as quickly as we reasonably can. Um, we've heard a lot from members of the public, and um, I invite um, additional comments from board members um, as to how uh, to, to frame um, uh, uh, how Michael, <laughs> Michael LaPlace, should frame uh, the response to council. Um, you know, I've, I've heard that folks are agnostic as, as to SPRAB itself, but don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I've heard support for a committee that uh, is called into play earlier in the process. Um, I mean, those are just two things, a whole lot uh, that's been said. So. Uh, Mr. Texarni, you've got your hand up. Other board members, uh, let me know if you want to uh, weigh yeah. in and offer some um, input yeah. for uh, for a response to council. Mr. Cohen, Mr. McGowan, go ahead, uh, Zenon. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like we've done this uh, in the past with various referrals, but I, I mean, I think that we should, um, you know, have a, an alternative in place, you know, when we disband it. I mean, if we disband, if the council decides to disband it, I think that that's that should, in my my opinion, I, I think that's what we should recommend is that you know an alternative is in place, you know whether it be kind of some sort of combination of um, you know having like a committee that reviews um, applications earlier off on in the process, and you know maybe also a, a committee that's kind of works with the planning board that is, includes design professionals. I don't know. Um, you know, what the best practices are out there. Um, you know, I, I would defer to the professionals um, on that. Um, but I, I mean, I think that, you know, we, we should, you know, if we disband it, we should, we should have a good alternative. So you, are you suggesting that we should tell council to replace SPRAB with another committee appointed by the mayor or that they should not disband SPRAB until the planning board has some committee that that is advisory to the planning board and uh, or, or is that in your mind a distinction without a difference I'm just trying to get a little more specific yeah I'm, I'm not sure I mean I, I just think that you know if can council decides to disband SPRAB you know an alternative should be in place that's 
think that's about it. So, yeah, go ahead. Did, go ahead. Well, let, uh, there are folks that let me um, call in Mr. Cohen and then Mr. McGowan. Um, sorry, people are starting to move around on my screen, so I don't want to give one order and then go with a different one. <laughs> I believe it was Mr. Quinn next. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Tim, uh, and then no, David, no, Dave, and then Dave, Alvin. David, Alvin, and Tim, then then myself. The, the no, I think it's the other way around. Be, the hands should be ordered in the in the order in which people raise them. If you look at the participants. Oh, oh, panel, sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm in the wrong um, zoom zoom on. Okay, good. David, go right ahead, and then Alvin. Yeah. So, um, if it wasn't already alluded to, I think that it's important that whatever uh, body has this um, responsibility, and that it that it I mean agree with everyone who's spoken so far that it's important to have this function. Um, whatever body serves this function should have professional expertise available to it. I think, Louise, your question to Zenon of what he was suggesting is premature because we don't know the answer of what we can do as planning board to bring in the professional expertise. Um, so, but I, you know, I kind of agree with Zenon that it, it is kind of premature to get rid of SPRAB when we don't know what is going to replace it. But I do think that we should immediately rectify those couple of items where SPRAB does not conform with the MLU, Alan, and remove their um, responsibility for uh, doing the determinations of major versus minor and for reviewing signs. And, and those just would be taken on by the planning board. It's, it's simple. It doesn't have to be part of the same deliberation about how we do design review in town. Um, Mr. McGowan? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> couple of the first, first thing, who is going to write this response to go back to council? Uh, Mr. Laplace writes writes the response based on um, planning board directions. I, I think that's correct. Isn't that how it works? <laughs> that's what they told me when I took this job, and that's what I've been doing for thirty three years. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, Thanks. Michael. So you're gonna get you're gonna get dumped on some more here. Well, <laughs> part of the fun of this job. What can I do? <laughs> that's why we pay in the big bucks. That's right. I, I, I feel like there could be, I, I'm looking at sort of sort of a framework of, of how to get there. And, and where I end up with is somehow a suggestion that council, council think about, council think about having some mechanism to, to, to preserve some of the the benefits that 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 SPRAB had has so so to, to be more specific uh, it seems like like the the memo back to to council should say you know there's we've had a long you know uh, we've had a long discussion and there's divided opinion about 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 where 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 they should go there list what those particular issues are. I mean, there's the legal issues that apparently Scrab cannot keep functioning the way it is now because it's outside of the the M, the MU, I can't say it. MU. MLU. MLU. You got it. You got it. You just pull in your That 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 you know it should be it should be written that 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 there that that's you know that's an issue. But there's also it also should say that in our in our deliberations, that there is, you know, some some great value that we've found in the in the process of what of what Scrab 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 does. Um, have that sort of as that outline to conclude to then go on to if you can conclude that our recommendation. And by the way, this is we're essentially a, an advisory committee, if you will. In this, in this, 
in this area. Um, you know, it's up, it's going to be up to council, and they're going to have to sit through all this stuff again uh, next week. That that you know, as we we you know, we think we we advise that if um, council is going to make a decision to get rid of scrap, that they should also they should consider some modifications to you know to to a scrap. Sprab operates right now, and um, you know they, they should debate that. Now I don't know, I don't know that they're. They, I understand that if we go this route, that that they may the council may not make a decision on Monday. Um, I, I don't know, but it seems to me that I'm just trying to figure out some way to get get these thoughts together and 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 some way to clearly get some of these. These thoughts together as as in, and present them to to the council where we're not saying definitely no we shouldn't you know we shouldn't get rid of it or definitely yes you know we should keep it I mean there's 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 some serious considerations here, Mr. McGowan. So that I, was, don't, it, for, don't forget there's two council members that are on this board that heard the whole breadth of the discussion this evening. So I think that's helpful, and then I'll just report back on all these major points that everybody's raising. Yeah. And the recordings available to members of the public and certainly members of council prior to their meeting, I assume. Well, okay, I, I still okay. I, I, oh, okay. All I all I know is I'm hearing different. I'm hearing the members here making suggesting different solutions to this to this problem. And I and I just think that you know if you really are serious about presenting something back to council, you, it, you, it should reflect those differences of opinion and what brought, and kind of what, and what brought them about. And then, you know, that's the best we're gonna be able to do. Yeah, I, I take your point. I think it's gonna be important to, um, well, as Mr. Laplace said, point out, and as you said, that there's a long discussion and a, a wide variety of, opinions and some disagreement but here are some things issues that were flagged that are that you know came up um repeatedly uh mr quinn and then mr bodekheimer i think mr o'donnell you had your hand up before me uh oh basically, I'm sorry. basically it's mr no mr yeah no i took my hand down mr cohen said basically what i was going to say okay, okay. First of all, for the members of the public who are still hanging around, um, this board, I think, values a public process above all. So our comments about this specific ordinance should not be confused with our advocating for something that is a less public process or that has you know, or for something that's done behind closed doors. I, I, I can speak for myself and I know served on this board for a long time. That's not the intent of this board. Uh, I, I would echo uh, Mr. O'Donnell's comment about how this was presented to us and when. Um, I know that the timeline for ordinance introduction is a tight one. Um, and I appreciate council asking for our comments, but if this was a year long process, some sort of heads up at some point would have been, would have been appreciated. Uh, I understand that you guys have a lot on, on your plate and, and that we as a board had precious little bandwidth, uh, last year. So there are a couple of things that I returned to in the, time that I've had to consider this. And I have had separate conversations with the chair and a, a very good conversation with Councilman Cohen. Um, it, one of them is the, that makes it makes a real point for me is that we have a board that's adding value, but that's not compliant with the municipal land use law. Uh, and so 
I think throwing the baby out with the bathwater is something that we didn't want to necessarily uh, do, but it's not our decision. I think that this board with a, a legal opinion from Mr. Muller that would take him a little bit of time in the law library, um, you know, could come up with a process that takes the best of SPRAB and brings it under the umbrella of this board. Significantly, I heard two members of SPRAB, including a current member, advocate for the for speak in support of disbanding SPRAB in its current form. That's significant to me. And, and the most significant thing for me in this discussion are the voices of our professionals. Um, I, you know, I, I think that I've heard uh, as close to a plea as I'm ever going to hear from any of our professionals. And I think that that I'm sure that it wasn't deliberate, but I, I think I heard some sort of discounting of their abilities um, to do design review. And I, I don't want to leave our professionals with the impression that that feeling is widespread among the board members. Um, you know, these are people who work very hard for us every day. And I, I heard some comments that I will assume um, were not meant to be what they sounded like, which was like giving them the hi hat. Uh, so I, I think it's hard for us to come up with a consensus to report to to speak to Alvin's point. Like I, I think usually we can come up with some sort of consensus to report back to council. I don't think this is going to happen. Um, and I, I think that they will proceed ha a, a pace. I mean, if they have the votes, then they're going to go ahead with this resolution. Uh, and I think that we should feel secure that we can take that piece of the ordinance that asks us to come up with something to, to essentially repl replace SPRAB and to the extent that we can create it hopefully in a public way or offer support to staff in a way that they can get the same kind of feedback. So it's 11-11 and I'm, I'm fried at this point. So I think it's time to stop talking. Thank you. Well, you speak wisely for a fried person. Um, Mr. Bodekheimer. Uh, thank you. Well, um, uh, Mr. Quinn said, uh, you know, a, a lot of the things that I was uh, going to say. I mean, I think if I were going to sum it up, I, I sort of feel like we'd, we'd like to be able to re reply to the council with some kind of recommendation uh, of what to preserve. And, you know, in Tim's, you know, statement, we're concerned about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But what I haven't heard in a lot of our general comments is which part of it of SPRAB is the baby and which part of the SPRAB is the bathwater. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, we're speaking in generalities about wanting to preserve those things, but we haven't really gone in, uh, into the specifics that would allow us to frame a resolution to go back to, 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 you know, to council and say, these are the things that we want to preserve. And these are the things that, you know, we could live without so that we could, you know, we, we you know, we could, we could be proactive, but I, I mean, I, I do tend to agree that it's going to take, it would take us a little while to, 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 to actually, I mean, it should be obvious what the baby is, and what the bathwater is, but this is a more complex situation. So, um, you know, obviously additional citizen oversight is, is, is baby a lot, you know, uh, design expertise is, is baby, um, adding additional time, being inconsistent with MLUL is bathwater, um, but you know I feel like we'd have to poll everyone on the you know uh, on the planning board to try to, to to figure out if we have consensus around a statement that we would all make, and I'm not sure that we have that, and that in that I agree with Tim. So you know, with that, I'll wrap up. I completely agree about 
what you identify as baby and what you identify as bathwater. The only thing I would add to bathwater are the uh, perceived or real potential conflicts of interest, um, which I think were flagged by uh, municipal council and, and others, uh, including uh, former members of SPRAB. Uh, On our Mr. board, Cohen. it should be baby with the stormwater, I think. <laughs> <laughs> So we want to keep the storm. We want to keep the, the storm yeah. on site. That's right. That's right, <laughs> David. So I I would agree with Louise um, that the conflicts of interest, there are perceived conflicts of interest, are bathwater as well. And uh, but the reason I raised my hand is I just wanted to bounce off Jerry. I know there's this concern that uh, design review board operating without design standards is problematic. And one of the things that's occurred to me is that if you get a board with design expertise, one could charge them with creating their own sort of bylaws that would be the design standards, at least provisionally, until the master plan uh, design element is able to be created. And I want, I wonder how you feel about that. And that would apply whether we keep this in, in house on the planning board as a subcommittee of the planning board, or if we have it be something that's outside the planning board. You're, you're muted, Jerry. Uh, I think it's a good idea. And it doesn't even have to be um, part of the bylaws. It could be, it could be ordinanced. Um, but I, I think the thought of, of looking to whoever the design professionals are for going that route and saying, you know, can you come up with a set of more, more specific standards um, that we can use is very good, very good thought. And it's not that there aren't things around the state that, that one could look at. And as I said earlier, within our own HPO. So, um... Uh, I'm not seeing any other hands up or uh, desire to talk about or you know raise any more separate comments. So in terms of um, the memo back to council, um, what I've heard is that there is not a clear consensus among board members about recommending whether council adopts or uh, does not adopt this ordinance, um, but there is a consensus about the need to immediately rectify the uh, legal uh, issues. Um, and there's consensus that the function of SPRAB is important, a la the, the baby <laughs> parts. The professional expertise is important, that citizen involvement and transparency are important, uh, that coordination with staff is really important, um, and that um, we should re resolve whatever duplication exists that create extra work for staff. Um, and if I, and, and that there is a need to to create, to develop for the for the municipality, uh, basic design standards, um, and I don't know whether we need to put this in a memo, but depending on how, you know, what council does, will determine whether or not um, it, it it comes back into our court to. Um, uh, you know, set up a framework for for a new committee or uh, advisory committee or subcommittee that um, that fulfills these functions that we find valuable. That's as good a summary as I can give at uh, eleven eighteen. Lou Louise Mia had her hand up. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mia. Yeah. I just had a question since this is a master plan consistency review and I think um, the there was an expectation that something would come out of this hearing in addition to the memo does is there any interest in the planning board and in addressing that 
question and I'm not sure how it was phrased, but you know, I think that's part of the problem. It was never clear from the beginning. Are we saying that abolishment is consistent with the master plan or continuing SPRAB is consistent with the master plan? Um, is it only consistent with the master plan if there is something in place? And if so, is that consistent with the master plan? And I think we can't know because there's it's not clear at this juncture what might be the replacement. Um, and I think it's it's it would be difficult to say that removing that removing SPRAB is inconsistent with the master plan. Um, because I don't I don't know that it's uh, in what way it's referred to directly. Anyway, I I, I don't know. Yeah, I saw that. I sort of that saw question, but I just yeah, want to I saw this is sort of different that. from our typical yeah. consistency review because it's not a land use ordinance, and you know I see Sprab's function as a design review, hopefully in the future integrated with technical review, not duplicative, but coordinated with staff. Um, as being consist very consistent with the master plan and whether that takes the form of SPRAB or so something else is a sort of a separate question. But um, I think Councilman so I, so Cohen, I saw it as a weird, uh, not quite consistency review, but maybe I'm wrong. Tim, what were you going to say? I, and then I, David made, I thought, if I'm remembering correctly, he cited several instances in the master plan talking about the importance of design review. So I think that the importance of design review is consistent with a master plan. And I think that more or less, we're all in agreement that design review, that having professional input into design informs our decisions as a board. Now, I would also argue and not argue, I would also say, on the other hand, that I think the MLUL, you know, sort of trumps, for lack of a better word, uh, the any master plan. One is law and one is a, is a planning document, so. But I think we already all agreed that uh, the inconsistencies with MLUL were definitely bathwater. I mean, nobody's arguing for keeping the pieces of SPRAB that are directly in conflict with the MLUL. That's right. So can I just ask a follow-up question, Jerry? In a master plan consistency review, is the planning board obligated to make, I mean, what the, like, what, what the planning board was asked was whether or not this ordinance was consistent with the master plan. So I, I don't know if the planning board needs to provide a ruling on that or not. So it could choose not to uh, make a decision on that. I, I also don't think we were asked that actually. I mean, to Louise's point, this isn't really a consistency review because it's yeah. not a land use ordinance. Yeah. yeah. But that was- Boy, I see it. I, 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 think, I think we, I think if we, stick to the consistency of design review um, or you know just sort of if we if we have to draw a, a, um, a direct line to the master plan which is um, fine then I would do that by expressing a you know a consensus that design review is viewed as valuable um, and and is consistent with the master plan. I, I think, you know, Michael May started actually his, his presentation with the idea that this really isn't a master plan uh, consistency review for the reasons you just gave a moment ago, Louise and uh, David alluded to, which is it, this really deals with process. And what the, uh, as he understood it, as I and Michael jump in, is what the council was looking for was feedback from the planning board to the extent the board wanted to give it is, is this, is this ordinance a good idea? Michael, do you want to? I, I, I'm sorry, Jerry, I, that... I just want to jump in that because the municipal attorney made very clear, and I know in a conversation that I had with her, that it was required by law to be referred to the planning board for master plan consistency review. So that's why I'm just, uh, you know, sort of emphasizing this. I want to make sure that having mm -hmm. past 11, that we don't leave tonight right. 
without having performed the basic thing that my understanding from her that was that this was not an option, just we want to hear what you have to say that it was required by law, law to refer it. So, you know, and maybe even if it's referred for master plan consistency review, there's still the option to just provide a general memo of feedback and not a yes or no answer, but just want to make sure we're, we're all right. I, 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 Jerry, you're absolutely right. That was what I was thinking at the top of this discussion. And I, I think I speak for all the staff that we, we see pretty clearly that if you wanted to review this, this ordinance, this particular ordinance in terms of consistency with the master plan, and as David pointed out, the master plan talks in a lot of different ways about the importance of design. This ordinance says that SPRAB is abolished, but design review is important and the planning board has the authority to continue and do site plan review in different ways, that there's other options available. So I would conclude, if I was testifying as a planning consultant, I would say, because you know how the language is, is that you have to look at an ordinance to say it's not inconsistent with the master plan. I would say I, this ordinance I, is not inconsistent with the master plan. That that would be yeah, my Yeah, I, I think that's sound reasoning, Michael. Yeah. Um, I, I, I honestly, you know, I think we should skirt the issue because if this ordinance standing on its own eliminates the design review that we have in Princeton right now. And this ordinance does not do anything to create a new structure for design review. So while it, while the memo opens the possibility that design could, review could happen in another way, you know, the, the substance of this ordinance is inconsistent with the master plan and that it eliminates design review in Princeton without doing anything to, um, to ensure that it will continue. David, but, I think, but I think we can, can, I, not, can I, I don't think we have to, that's not I, the message we have to send back. We can just but, sort of say, you know, there's, we can't, we can't be, um, you know, we can't, we can't make a judgment on it. I have to ask a question of Councilman Cohen. So you're saying that SPRAB is the only entity that's doing design review in Princeton. Right. And if SPRAB doesn't exist, there's no design review in Princeton because I think staff finds that rather offensive or, you know, I, that's, that's a little I, insult. I, I, I know you, you say that, Michael, but, you know, there were some of the comments from the public that very correctly said staff is responsible for reviewing for consistency with our ordinances and state ordinances. And that's what you guys do. And it's not design review. But it's not all we do, David. I can show you reports that I have done to SPRAB and they have echoed my comments. It was done as recently as the review for West Windsor Real, Real Estate. I mean, I just think you're not giving engineering and planning and all the other professionals credit that there's a lot of design review going on. And then I would argue that when it gets to the planning board, the planning board is doing design review. That's why we've actually changed projects for the better recently. Sorry, I'm going to jump and in. That, and that, that, Mr. O'Donnell has ahead, his Jim. hand up, uh, Louise, just so oh. you know. <laughs> After you. Mr. Purcell. Jim, go ahead. And then Owen. I just wanted to echo what Michael said. I mean, we may not get into the design review that SPRAB has done in terms of Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna say architectural and aesthetics and 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 but we do look at neighborhood character because it's part of the ordinance that we have to look at neighborhood character. We do make recommendations. I mean, you you'll you'll see a memo that I just wrote that um, regarding actually this evening's memo that I wrote that. They met the letter of the law, but that they're going beyond the letter of the law and that their own, uh, and they agreed to look at it, their stormwater design, I, I made a comment in, in my memo that said is not in, in keeping with the, the, the what, what did I say, the, the expectations of the community. Uh, this, that, that's not just looking at it from an ordinance standpoint, it's offering other comments regarding their design decisions. So um, 
you know, Michael said that we, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I guess you use the word insulting. I just take umbrance to the fact that we've heard a lot tonight, and Mr. Quinn mentioned it, that makes us feel like our, we have less value than we feel we have. Um, yeah, and so, I, would, I would retract offensive. I would just say our feelings are hurt because we're, we are feeling a little unappreciated. My feelings aren't well, hurt. I just, um, I just almost, <laughs> never mind. I, I don't want to continue. I'm, I've said enough. Um, Mr. O'Donnell. Yeah, okay. I, I just want to say, first of all, that um, me, whatever Ms. Sachs' uh, conversation with the municipal lawyer was, uh, neither Dolores Williams' memo nor Michael's mentions anything about reviewing this for conformance with the master plan. So in that case, I have to say that uh, I, for one, went into this blind, not knowing exactly what I was reviewing it for. Um, you know, uh, so th there's that. Um, I also want to say that you know I I feel very badly that it seems like some of us are being pitted against the staff, and I hope that that doesn't come across that you know they're they're really you know we the appreciation we have for all the work that you do is extremely high. Um, however, I do still feel that uh, taking away in any way a very important public forum for public experts to also weigh in on applications is not a good idea, especially with everything that's coming down the pike these days. And I think that there are ways to better make that help the staff rather than prove to be a hindrance. That's all I have to say. I think that's a really important point that um, whatever comes next, um, it's just crucial that um, staff be, that, that it um, address some of the um, you know, very keenly felt frustrations um, that staff have made really clear tonight. Um, and I know that nobody intended to throw sharp elbows, and I know that there are bruises anyway. <laughs> um, so I, I too, uh, you know, regret that. But um, so we sort of summarized a little bit earlier um, for Mr. Laplace, some things to capture in a memo um, uh, uh, to council. I um, think there's consensus, well, I, I think there's consensus that we want to, or, or are willing to skirt the question of consistency. Am I misreading that or? I don't think we're in a position to determine members, whether Mr. it is Penn, or not. Please. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I talked over you. I apologize. I don't no, think we're I'm, in a position. I'm inviting you to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're in a position to, to, to know whether it's consistent with the master plan based on the, the, the master plan calls for design review. I don't know that design review goes away if SPRAB is um, is abolished. Um, yeah, I think I think staff have made clear that it does not. What what does go away are other things that are consistent with the master plan, including a public, you know, and transparent community based process. Sure, and and again, I I. I don't want to speak for anyone else on the board, but I I support that, and it's my hope that that we can build something that preserves the best of what we get from Sprab in a, that that's under the umbrella of the of the planning board, which. I don't feel that SPRAB is under the <laughs> umbrella of the planning board right now. I feel like it's, it operates sort of on its own. And it does, it does provide services. Uh, Ms. Seam made a really good point that 
that um, it's it's one thing for us to say we can imagine a different design review advisory board for the planning board, but what are the implications for zoning? SPRAB also serves zoning. So um, I don't have an answer to that, obviously, but. I'm happy that yeah, Michael wrote it down. I agree, it's an important point. So Michael, do you want to, um, based on what you've heard, uh, summarize the high points of what would go in your memo? I, I think we need to bring this conversation, um, I think we need to, to land this plain <laughs> well i i was taking notes to draft something i guess i'll have to do it tomorrow because this is on the agenda for the council on monday um you want me to go through all my notes or do you want me to draft something and distribute it tomorrow what would you prefer um it Mr. sounds Muller like the board is, is not the board's not going to weigh in on consistency with the master plan so i see this as a report with the major points and and comments is that correct that have been raised? Yes, I I mean, I, I can go through them. They're yeah, I, I, I don't want. Huh. I have to read my writing here. Guess that's right. I, I, I don't want to, you know, completely ignore the, I mean, I, I, I think, I think it makes sense for us to articulate the things that we, that there was consensus on the board about. Well, I think that, the confusing um, thing, I think the confusing thing is that a lot of the comments that I took notes on that the board said are about how to improve design review, which makes sense, but it doesn't really address the ordinance itself. You know, and I think the council was looking for guidance on the ordinance before us. Yes, and I think that if you and and trying to remember I, what various people said, starting with Mr. Um, McGowan, but that there's been a long discussion that um, there are uh, differing opinions on some of the details, but that we all agree that immediately rectifying the legal issues is crucial. Um, yeah, I can that go to the your design summary. review function is important. Mm -hmm. Can I, um, can I make a suggestion? Professional expertise, yes. <laughs> um, can I suggest that we, what I've said we ask Mr. Laplace to share his memo with the planning board? And if anything, if we, if a member feels that some point has been missed that we think council needs to hear that he didn't catch in his notes or he couldn't read his notes that we have the ability <laughs> to that we have the ability to communicate that to him before he submits his memo to uh to council yeah based is, on is this that discussion at all feasible tonight, right but not well we have to can do you it get us, we have to do can, it we have to do it tomorrow right i think he's got yeah. to write the memo and make, and make sure it gets to Council, when does council right. actually have to have it? On Monday? They should, have really like ha they should really have it tomorrow. And unfortunately, I have a dental appointment tomorrow morning, which I'm really looking forward to anyway. So. <laughs> Although it's kind of it's kind of a pleasant change from <laughs> running this memo. <laughs> well, I'm right here. But I could probably it's get it out early afternoon. And then, you know, if everybody could take a look at it and just give you, I mean, I don't know what else to do. It's going to be pretty long because there's a lot of comments. Well, but I, I, I don't I don't think it needs to be super long. I mean, I, I think that um, you know, right. We said points, a lot of the same things, right? Yes, yeah. Michael, can Justin work on a draft in the morning for you? Uh, I'm gonna have to organize my notes. I was writing as fast as I could. So right. we'll we'll get this out. I think we can get it out maybe after lunch at the at the I don't want to face the wrath of Dolores. 
Yeah. I, I, I also um, took some notes so I can share my notes with uh, Michael. That and then the great. expectation would be that board members would have a chance to review and if they had any, if they felt that something was missed, they could suggest a change to you. Is that? Yeah. But I think tomorrow, I, I, I can by, tell the clerk that. Afternoon. I can Does tell that, the clerk by the end that of we'll tomorrow have... afternoon. Right. Does I that, can tell... Does that seem like a good idea, other board members? Yes. Or... All right. Yeah, if Michael can get it out by one, and we can get people can get their comments back by three, so that. I mean, Dolores won't be thrilled, but I think that's the best we can do. That sounds you tell, fine. You tell her to okay. give me a call. That Mr. sounds Cohen. that sounds like a plan, <laughs> and I'll a bunch of notes too, and I'll um, put them in bullet points and send them along just in case they're helpful. And um, if I can be helpful uh, in the morning when you're at the dentist, I'm happy to uh, do whatever I can then too. Maybe maybe I'll change my appointment. So we'll we'll on. touch base on this in the morning, okay? And, I, um, I didn't really want to uh, go to the dentist anyways. Maybe I'll see if I can <laughs> change my appointment. <laughs> Unless they charge you for not. So um, thank you board members and staff for hanging in and what I hope is our latest meeting of the year because huh. I, nobody wants to be at this uh, at this hour. I really appreciate it. That was a tough discussion, but a good one, I think. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Are you uh -oh. the on this, I, I think Cohen. that's Mr. Cohen's call. <laughs> <laughs> we're changing. We're changing up a lot of things this year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. 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 Thank you.